Fallout 76 is a fascinating and a very important game for anybody who loves Fallout. And that's specifically because this is the worst reviewed Fallout game in history, both by critics and players. The response to it is going to inevitably have an impact on Fallout 5 and potentially on all of Bethesda's future outputs. This is a huge deal. And yet nobody seems interested in trying to figure out what went wrong with Fallout 76. Oh, there's been plenty of discussion, but it always seems to go for the very easy answers. Bugs, frame rate issues, connection issues, missing features for the PC version, very poorly handled merchandise. And absolutely, those are all very bad things. And yet games with those exact same issues have had a much warmer critical and player response than Fallout 76 in the past. You see, I reckon that all those easy answers are distracting us from a much more interesting conversation. You could wave a magic wand today and fix all the bugs and the frame rate issues and give everybody a free canvas bag, and Fallout 76 still wouldn't be a great game. But, on the other hand, if we could figure out what was wrong under the bonnet, where the core gameplay has gone astray, and we could figure out how to fix it, well, let's just say the Fallout community is uniquely well qualified to forgive a game for being buggy if the gameplay's great. So I want to figure out what went wrong. I want to discuss the decisions that were made about this game that could have been made differently. And most of all, I want this to be a constructive discussion. I want to figure out how, or if, Fallout 76 can be fixed. So, let's get started, shall we? So, first, a bit of franchise context. You see, Fallout games have an odd habit of coming out in pairs, where a radically new take on Fallout comes out once per decade, but gets a companion built in a very similar engine about two years later. Fallout 1, followed by Fallout 2, Fallout 3 by New Vegas, and now Fallout 4 by 76. Now, the relationship between these pairs of games can be fascinating, and probably well worth a video essay all to itself. But right now, a good starting point for our discussion is that Fallout 76 inherited a set of gameplay mechanics from Fallout 4, but 76 also found itself in a bit of a tricky position, because while its inherited game engine and limited development time meant that it had to utilise and recycle plenty of Fallout 4, just as New Vegas had to use much of Fallout 3 as a base, Fallout 76 made this huge shift from single-player campaign to online multiplayer service. Now that's a tricky transition to make under any circumstances. And then they chose to include forms of PvP. Survival mechanics made their first appearance outside of an optional side mode. Settlements were replaced by new build anywhere camps. Leveled weapons and armor, a much stronger focus on audio logs, environmental details and notes for storytelling. The first ever immediate post-war setting, player launch nukes. That's a lot of stuff to shove in. And I don't think any of those are inherently bad things. But I am reminded of an old poster that did the rounds in the UK about a decade ago. Individual systems that look fine on paper and might have worked independently can end up clashing with each other, just like these three cogs would. There's actually a really simple example of this right in the opening moments of the game with how Fallout 76 introduces the new VAT system. You see, I've not really got an issue with VATs in Fallout 76. Sure, they had to remove the ability for it to pause or slow time in an online game, but it serves its purpose, allowing a more tactical style of combat where the player is focusing on managing action points, chance to hit, and a critical meter instead of focusing on manual aim. And much like Fallout 4, specialised VATs character builds are extremely viable, and once the critical perks start unlocking during the mid-game, VATs builds can become extremely strong. So I was somewhat surprised when the initial reviews came in for Fallout 76 and a common complaint I saw was that VATS wasn't enjoyable and didn't work well. And then I realised what the problem is. You only get one first impression and Fallout 76 gives VATS a terrible one. You see, people are going to leave the vault, try out VATS and if they have a bad experience with it, they might never bother with it again. Unfortunately, the vault is surrounded by Liberators, a new robot enemy. They're a cute addition to Fallout 76's impressively large range of enemies, but they have a problem. Vance just doesn't seem to work on them. What you're seeing right now is a high level character that I've specialised towards Vance, and even then, I'm struggling to hit these guys at fairly close range. And to this day, I'm not quite 100% sure why that is. I assume it's because the game gives a reduced chance to hit the head, because normally hitting the head gives you bonus damage, and as these things seem to be made up of 90% head, therefore they're just hard to hit. 
but adding the fact that they move around a lot faster than the vast majority of enemies, so the chance to hit swings up and down very rapidly, the fact there's a bunch of bushes around the area which they can easily become obscured by, reducing chance to hit to zero, and these guys are basically a nightmare in VATS. But here's the same character taking on other low-level enemies, and as you can see, that's vastly easier. I don't think there's actually anything wrong with the new VATS, and I don't think there's anything wrong with the idea of a small enemy that's easier to hit with certain control mechanics and less easy to hit with others. But if you fill the game's first area with only that enemy, people are going to assume VATS doesn't work. Decent enough ideas individually, put them together, and it breaks. Cox. But we're getting into specifics a bit early here. Let's start off at the very highest level that we can. The core gameplay loop that Fallout 76 inherited and iterated on. So in Fallout 4, the gameplay ultimately boils down to exploring a location, finding materials there, crafting weapons and armor using those materials, thus becoming stronger and more capable of exploring new locations, and so the loop continues. Fallout 76 inherited this, but it made a change. A very, very big one, in fact. Because in Fallout 4, you unlock modifications for weapons and armor by taking perks, where each perk unlocked new mods for a vast array of weapons, grouped into melee, guns, explosives, and energy. This made the loop work, because it meant there was always plenty to craft, and if you found a new gun, you'd probably already have some mods you could craft to improve it. Therefore, you naturally replaced basic weapons with more advanced ones as you found them, and you always had a use for all sorts of different components. Fallout 76 replaced the perk system with the weapon scrapping system. This meant that when you found a new weapon, you didn't know how to craft any mods for it, but taking the weapon to a workbench and scrapping it gave you a chance of learning a single mod for that specific weapon. This created a lot of problems. You see, in Fallout 4, finding a new weapon is an event. Let's say you find your first plasma pistol. Now that's a cool moment, because until you come across a legendary variant, that plasma pistol can just be your plasma pistol from now on. And if you've already got any perks in science, you can start modding it right away. And if not, just take the first rank of science next level. In Fallout 76, that scenario plays out very differently. When you find your first plasma pistol, it's useless. After all, your existing loadout likely includes some common weapons that you found plenty of, scrap 99% of them, and thus you'll have heavily modded the one you're using. But that plasma pistol isn't modded. So the most sensible and common reaction to finding a new gun, a sexy piece of pre-war military technology, is to smash it with a hammer under the assumption that it might be useful to you if you find and smash 20 more of them. And this isn't just theory. This actually happened to me. I really wanted to go over to energy weapons in 76. In fact, when I stumbled across my first gamma gun, I got a bit overexcited, took a science perk or two, all ready to move over, but the laser pistols I kept finding were vastly worse than modded pipe weaponry. So I smashed the very weapon I wanted to use and just kept smashing everyone I found, like some form of militant Luddite. And then, eventually, so goes the theory, if you smash enough weapons that you actively would like to be using, maybe you'll learn how to make a better receiver and the weapon will be worth bothering with. Now, if this sounds slightly mad to you, that's normal. The whole process is slightly surreal and it doesn't make much sense because, to be clear, you can break down 20 of the same basic gun and each time learn how to make a slight variant of it, even if none of the guns you broke down had that variant on them. And by the way, this process will take a while because Fallout 76 added in a lot of new weapon components and many of them are functionally identical especially true for barrels. So many pointless barrels. Now, before we go any further, we need to understand what's actually going on here under the hood. And that means it's time to talk probabilities. So every time you scrap a weapon, the game starts rolling dice in the background. You see, there's a list of mods for each weapon, each of which has a probability of being unlocked. Some likely to be unlocked, some very unlikely. The game rolls a dice against every mod you haven't unlocked yet and then awards you a new mod based on which dice roll gave the best result assuming any roll succeeded, as when you're down to the last few mods you might get no successes and thus gain nothing on that scrap. From the player's point of view therefore, on average you will unlock common and thus weak mods on just about every weapon scrap at the start of the game and as time goes by some more powerful and rare mods will start appearing as they'll have less competition in the unlock lottery because you've already unlocked some basic mods and removed them from the pool. And once you're down to the last few mods, an average player will probably end up scrapping multiple weapons without unlocking any mods before happening to get lucky and unlocking the final few. 
Now this, to my mind, is not a good system, and it highlights the risk of randomness in a game. Randomness can be a great part of a game, of course, but you have to be very careful to pair it with a certain level of transparency, because asking the player to take part in a lottery without giving them any information about the odds can be extremely frustrating. In this system, the source of the frustration is obvious. You could scrap a gun 10 times and get no mod unlocked from any of those scraps. But you have no way of knowing if you've actually unlocked all the mods or if you've just been unlucky, because the game never tells you whether or not there are still mods to unlock. But it gets worse, because some mods that do exist in the game can't be unlocked by scrapping at all, and there's no consistency for which ones can or can't. You can scrap most weapons to learn recon scopes, for example, but not night vision scopes. If you want those, you'd have to find the plan for the mod in a shop or out in the wild. Plasma weapons can unlock basic splitter and flamer variants by scrapping, but the advanced, stabilised and true variants can't be. Sledgehammers can unlock heavy rocket and heavy spiked variants through scrapping, but for entirely obvious reasons, the heavy spiked rocket can't be unlocked that way. So, ultimately, we have a lottery where the player doesn't know what the prizes are, or whether there even is a prize left, or what the odds of winning might be. This is bad randomness. And that's not just theory. We're only just getting started here, because this quickly starts spiralling into unintended gameplay consequences. You see, the practical result of this at launch was that for many players, some weapons were rendered effectively useless, because the low probability of unlocking decent mods at first meant that you could never find enough of them to learn the mods to make them good. This actually happened to me. I was a pistol user that had a pipe revolver as my day-to-day -day weapon, a gun so basic that you know the schematic automatically at level 1. Conveniently, enemies frequently drop this weapon as well, so I had just about every mod for it fairly quickly. So when I reached a high enough level that single-action revolvers started to spawn in, I planned to switch over. But the unmodded single-action revolver was inferior to my modded pipe revolver. And because it's not a common drop, I never found enough of them to get any good mods, because the lottery means that on average, you'll work your way through plenty of trash barrel mods before you get anything good, like a simple damage boosting receiver. And then the western revolvers started spawning in, and the same thing happened again. And this wasn't just me. We know from Bethesda that this is a widespread problem, because in the patch of January 29th, they made License Plumber, the perk pertaining exclusively to pipe weapons, weaker, commenting that it was overperforming, and they were worried that it was seen as a mandatory pick. In short, a lot of people were taking a perk for pipe weaponry, meaning a lot of people were using pipe weaponry, rather than switching over to the more powerful guns that in Fallout 4 would have replaced the pipe revolver fairly early on in the game. Now you're probably thinking that it sounds pretty insane that there's a genuine problem that I can't find enough guns to smash apart to learn enough about them to actually use the gun, but don't worry, the rabbit hole goes much deeper yet. You see, unlike in Fallout 4, you can build guns from scratch in Fallout 76 once you find or buy the plans for them. This is fairly useful because weapons are leveled, so being able to get a level 20 variant the moment you hit level 20 is convenient. But the game doesn't distinguish between weapons you've found and weapons you've crafted. So for weapons that aren't commonly dropped by enemies, some people have ended up crafting weapons purely so that they can smash them, which does admittedly sound like something a serial killer would do. There are a lot of problems here. One of them is the system doesn't make sense. Sure, mechanically on paper it's simple enough, but it's not intuitive. Why does breaking down a weapon 50 times cause you to slowly learn more mods for it? And this is where we get into what this video is all about. You see, it's very easy to criticise, but what's more interesting is trying to see how this might reasonably be fixed. Now hopefully, my proposed solution shouldn't shock Bethesda too much, because it's pretty much a variant of a system in a little game called Skyrim. You see, in Skyrim, you improved your ability to do something through practicing it. If you did lots of smithing, you'd slowly get better at smithing. Now, this is a nice solution in terms of being both intuitively sound and mechanically elegant. Getting better at making something by making lots of them is easy to grasp, and a system where you insert raw materials and time and receive improved skill and a refined item you can either use or sell to the blacksmith who's standing right there is a very smooth process. And honestly, this wouldn't even be much of a shift for Fallout 76. Once we've got to the stage where people are crafting weapons just to break them down, then we're already pretty much there. Just migrate the point where mods are learnt from the scrapping to the crafting. The system works basically the same way, 
except you're no longer being incentivized to pick up and drag heavy guns back to base. Instead, we bring much lighter junk, build guns, and then either sell or scrap them when we're done, giving us more flexibility on whether we want our new guns to be converted into money or scrap to recycle some of the components we use to make it. We could also remove some of the randomness by adding a chance to learn mods to, you know, modding the weapon. So if you want to learn a new type of scope, then you craft a scope for that gun, and that would generate a chance that you'd learn a new scope mod. I like this idea because, first, it makes sense that building a particular type of modification would give you insights into how to build variants of the same thing, and second, it breaks up the monotony of just making the same basic gun over and over again. And this is why I think building to learn is a much more interesting system than scrapping to learn. Scrapping is a single flat process. You press a button to scrap and it's scrapped, and behind the scenes the lottery begins. A repetitive action leads to a random result. But building is a more complex process, where we can start doing fun things to weight the chances of unlocking mods, so we can start interacting with the process to increase the chances of getting what we want. One of your odds of unlocking more rare or powerful mods rose if you crafted higher level guns or higher level mods, thereby investing more materials into them. What if we gave bonuses to characters with high intelligence or luck? What if we factored in how many crafting related perk cards have been taken? The change would also solve another problem because uh, it's time to revisit those cogs and that means it's time to talk about weight. Fallout has always had a carry capacity system. It's been in literally every game, and historically it's worked very well. It fits nicely into Fallout's role-playing side as a variable limit calculated off your character's strength stat. It's a subtle way to discourage people from treating Fallout like a straight-up shooter by stopping you carrying around endless guns. And in terms of character balance, I've always found the additional carry capacity as a nice compensation for melee and unarmed characters, who in older Fallout games especially were often more vulnerable in combat. Now Fallout 76 should be a natural fit for the carry capacity system, because the survival mechanics and the need to carry food and water adds new interesting choices about what you should and shouldn't carry with you. And I say that with confidence because it worked brilliantly in Fallout 4 survival mode. In case you never played survival mode, it was Fallout 4's highest difficulty, and rather than just increasing enemy health and damage like Skyrim's legendary mode, it added a whole bunch of interesting new mechanics. One major change was that survival mode massively reduced your base carry capacity, meaning that you had to be very careful about what to take with you. Better armor might be heavier, and the best mods for your guns might add significantly to their weight. For the first time ever in Fallout 4 survival mode, I modded my weapons to be slightly less powerful and less accurate in order to get their weight down. And then there was the question of how much food and drink should you take, bearing in mind you might be able to scavenge some out there, and of course you have to leave some empty space to carry resources for further crafting back home when you're done. The tension eases later in the game as you unlock armor mods to increase carry capacity, but the first 20 or so levels in Fallout 4 survive mode is some of the most fun I've ever had with the franchise. Now that worked in Fallout 4 because what you were gathering was exclusively junk items, with deliberately low weight so you could get a decent haul of them home. But as we were just discussing, Fallout 76 still wants you to bring home junk, but now it wants guns too. And some guns are heavy. If you're a rifle user in Fallout 76, the base weight of the weapon that you'll have to routinely carry home to scrap is about seven pounds. And that means you'll be over encumbered. A lot. And Bethesda clearly knew that was gonna happen because they modified the rules for being over encumbered to be extremely generous. You can now run at normal speed, the fastest movement short of sprinting, even when over encumbered at a cost of AP. This throws out Fallout 4 survival mode's careful planning of what to take with you to ensure that you have enough spare space for looting, because being over encumbered is so inconsequential that when I go over the carry limit, I never stop to drop something. Instead I think, well, may as well be way over the limit then, and start grabbing literally everything. And clearly I'm not alone in that, because Bethesda recently patched the game to introduce a hard cap to your inventory of £1,500 over the over encumbered soft cap. Though in all fairness, this was also related to an item duplication exploit. So, how do we make carry weight work in Fallout 76? It's a difficult question, and I think we should start with a little bit of history. Back in the old days of Fallout, the game took a very brutal approach to carry capacity. A base carry weight of only £25, plus a further £25 for each point of strength your character possessed. So a strength 1 character only got £50 total. Yeah, old Fallout wasn't kidding around. On average though, a typical character with strength of 5 would have £150. 
and since then, every generation has got a little bit more generous. Fallout 3 went for £150 base, with a further £10 per point of strength. The same average character would now get £200. Fallout 4 adds another £50 onto the base carry weight, though the slightly lower number of available special points meant slightly lower average strength. A typical character would likely be looking at about 230 or £240 total. The increase in Fallout 4 did make sense though, it was most likely to offset the fact that Fallout 4 was the first Fallout with a major crafting focus, as well as a modular armour system. Combat armour in Fallout 3, for example, weighed 20 to 30 pounds, depending on variant, whereas a full set of combat armour pieces in Fallout 4 weighs up to 45 pounds with the heavy variant. Though I should also flag that Fallout 4's armour crafting system allowed for significant boost to carry capacity above these levels. But then there was a change. Fallout 76 lowered the base carry weight of Fallout 4. A very interesting move for a game which, as we've established, wants us to do even more carrying than Fallout 4 did. The base is now down to £155, with only an extra £5 per point of strength, half the benefit per strength point than in Fallout 3 and 4, meaning an average character would start the game with £160, a figure so low it's impossible to achieve in Fallout 4, before working their way up to £195 by the end of the game. To be clear, Bethesda changed the carry weight calculation so that you need to be strength 11 in Fallout 76 just to have the same carry capacity as a strength 1 character in Fallout 4. Now that's a very illuminating decision I think, especially when we pair it with the newly added presence of weight reduction perks. These are perk cards that reduce the weight of a particular type of item. Medicine and drugs, explosive throwables, certain ammo types or certain weapon types. Excluding rifles. Rifles don't get one. Everything else gets one. Shotguns, heavy guns, pistols. Melee doesn't, but melee users are going to have strength 15, so they don't need it. Seriously, Bethesda, why don't rifles have a weight reduction perk? Sorry, that just really bugs me. My point is, Fallout 76 has a very odd relationship to weight. You start off with relatively low carry capacity in a game where not only do you have more stuff to carry around than you used to have, as now food and drink are important, and with the return of gun condition, spare weapons are now more important, and on top of that, certain items have had their weight massively increased. Like, stim packs now weigh one pound each. They have literally never had weight before in a Fallout base game. Even in Fallout 4 survival mode, they only weighed 0.1 pounds. So I think what we're seeing here is a system that was pulled in a few different directions. You see, if you were planning to make a game that was a hardcore survival experience, some of what I've just described is exactly what you do. Lowering the base carry weight is in fact exactly what was done by the definitive Jay Sawyer mod, a New Vegas mod created by New Vegas' own project director, Josh Sawyer, that reduced the base carry weight from £150 down to just 50 Fallout 4 Survival Mode likewise reduced the base carry weight from 200 down to 75 so as Fallout 76 is in part a survival game, reducing the base carry capacity and the amount of carry weight gained from strength is to be expected. The addition of a very high weight for stim packs points to the intention of a more hardcore experience too. After all, you can't just spam stim packs if you can only carry a limited number of them. That's just a game that wants players to think very hard about what they should or shouldn't take with them and have to make tough choices about their loadouts. But then the carry weight perks come in and they tell a very different story. And I think what we're seeing here is a compromise. Sure, they wanted to make a survival experience, but it's likely there was also a reasonable concern that some Fallout 4 players were probably used to and expecting to be able to carry around a good sized arsenal. And we do perhaps need to keep in mind how well Fallout 4 sold. At around 15 million copies, that's nearly double what New Vegas did. And while we don't have precise data for sales of the original Fallout games, Brian Fargo in 2017 estimated around 600,000. There are a huge number of players whose only exposure to Fallout is Fallout 4, and that had to be in some people's minds when they were making decisions about Fallout 76. And so I suspect a compromise emerged. A reduced carry capacity and other moves towards a hardcore survival experience but with the addition of the perk cards, which could reduce the weight of medicine by 90%, or your chosen weapon class by between 75 and 90%, unless you are a rifle user, in which case screw you, I suppose. This is the same logic, I suspect, that left the map completely covered with stash boxes in every train station and gas station, so you can regularly scrap and stash your junk, removing the need to tactically plan a looting run. And because of this compromise, this is a very messy system, because... 
I don't think it really suits at anybody. People who want to not worry about carry weights at all still have to waste significant amounts of perk cards and special points on reducing weight, as every weight reduction perk card has three ranks. So if you want your armor and chems and grenades and junk and weapons to be extremely light, then I hope you enjoy 15 levels worth of perks just to fighting your own inventory. Meanwhile, people who like the sound of a hardcore survival Fallout experience, like Fallout 4 Survival Mode, like myself, and I freely admit we're probably in the minority, well, I feel conflicted about these perks. I'd rather they weren't there, but not quite enough to not take all three ranks of packed rats. But let's focus on one thing we can all agree on here. Taking a perk should be a fun thing. It should be something interesting that changes your game ideally in a way that facilitates your chosen playstyle. I'd say examples of good perks are Black Widow and its variants, which both impact combat and open up new dialogue options. New Vegas's and Stay Back and its Fallout 76 equivalent Enforcer are great perks because they add a new and distinctive effect exclusively to shotguns. Penetrator in Fallout 4 is a great perk because it opens up brand new options for VATS characters in combat and is locked to only characters with extremely high perception. Taking a perk to make the weight of a stim pack drop from 0.7 pounds to 0.4 pounds is not fun. It is basically bookkeeping for your inventory. From the point of view of most players, reducing the base carry capacity and then adding a bunch of perks to reduce item weight boils down to creating a problem and then asking the player to spend their time solving it. So, what's the solution? Well, there are two I can think of, but they both boil down to the philosophy that trying to please everybody means you'll please no one. The first option is the easy one, and I think it would be an improvement, but it's not my preferred solution. Get rid of every single perk that reduces the carry weight of items. Offset that by increasing both the base carry weight and the bonus weight you gain per strength point. And as you've just freed up a load of perk cards, take the opportunity to add in some fun new ones. There are plenty of great perks from Fallout 4 and Fallout New Vegas that didn't make it into 76. Let's get some of those back in. But that's not what I think we actually should do. And you're going to call me crazy here, but... I think we should lower carry capacity further. And I'd also be tempted to get rid of the carry weight perks too. Bear in mind, this is my version of Fallout 76, where we've already got rid of gun scrapping. But I say, if we're going to do a survival game, let's do it properly. Before I get into the details of how I see this working, I need to take you back to September 2018, which is when I first got to play the preview version of Fallout 76 and chat to the dev team about it. And I asked them, did they foresee that players would take on specialised roles in a team or if they thought people would play as generalists. And they replied generalists. And this I think is why. In a world where you can just keep taking perks until you've got room to hold everything you need, why wouldn't you be a generalist? You don't need a designated team healer if everyone has a giant pile of their own stim packs. But to paraphrase the Incredibles, if everybody's special, then no one is. In a world in which nobody has much incentive to specialise because you can comfortably be a sniper and a shotgunner and use explosives and heal yourself and craft everything, well then everyone's going to do everything and then everybody will be broadly the same. But if we massively reduce carry weight, then I think we end up with a whole bunch of positive outcomes. But let's focus for now on what it could mean for how players interact with each other. This change strongly encourages specialisation, teamwork and communication. For players in teams, this means people taking on distinct roles and choosing specialist perks in that direction. Everybody fights, sure, but they also have a single secondary support role. Let me give you an example. Because stim packs are so heavy, you don't want to carry many of them around, and that makes everyone that you do have precious. So what if everybody handed their stim packs over to a designated healer, someone who would take all the first aid perks so that they could use a stim pack and it not only healed 100% of their health, but everybody in their team too, in a great big healing burst. And you can already do this. It's a charisma perk called Team Medic, but you rarely see it, because in a world where everyone's carrying around 30 stim packs, why would anybody bother? This would need a lot of other changes to support it, of course. The perk card system was specifically designed to allow people to fulfil multiple roles, as the You Will Emerge videos make explicitly clear. 
There is a fairly easy fix for this though, because I think Fallout 4 had the right idea where perks were tied to special stats, including perks that could only be taken if you maxed out a particular stat. This meant that the elite perks like Penetrator, Pain Train and Gun Fu were exclusively for characters who specialised in that direction, and that made different character builds very distinct. Right now every perk card has a level requirement and a special commitment. This means that even characters with very low special stats can utilise the most advanced specialised skills in the game just by virtue of getting up to the right level. And that doesn't seem right to me. So I say, just add on a minimum special requirement. This shouldn't even be controversial. Every previous Fallout game has many perks gated behind levels, skill points and special requirements. If we're feeling particularly ballsy, we could even scrap the special commitment completely. If you meet the special criteria and you own the card, then you just have the card active at all times. And this would get rid of the nonsense of having to routinely equip and then unequip lockpicking, hacking and crafting perks, which I end up doing a lot because the vast majority of them have no combat benefits. Getting back to weight specifically, that would need more work to rebalance as well, absolutely. We'd need new perks for characters to be great cooks, for example, where they could make meals that fill an entire hunger bar off a single food item, or new perks that allow characters to maintain other people's weapons out in the field. In my version of Fallout 76, we don't just magic items lighter using perk cards, we accept that we can't do everything, and instead get really good at a handful of things, to better utilise the small amount of stuff that we can carry. And though I've been talking about teams so far, I think this would actually work really well for single players too. Because the game right now is too easy. Too easy in general, and too easy to just do everything for yourself specifically. This is one of the reasons that 99% of the time, players meeting each other just give each other a wave and then move on. Why would they communicate? They don't need anything from each other. But imagine a world where you're a skilled healer, but you don't have any water or food left, and you see another player. Because in my system, there's always going to be some form of scarcity. And that means you have a very real reason to communicate with other players, to ask to trade goods or services. Maybe they have one of my new perks that lets them do field maintenance on your weapons for free. Maybe they have the philanthropist perk, which we could update to work on all nearby players, not just teammates, where he agrees to drink a purified water while you're standing next to him, which gives both of you the benefit. Maybe you've got one of my new first aid perks, which lets you heal another character for free on a cooldown, which you could offer in trade. After all, free first aid healing as a skill action was a thing back in old Fallout. Let's bring it back. It might even increase the chance of solo players choosing to temporarily team up rather than just wave and move on. And as for solo players who are absolutely determined to work exclusively alone, well, no one's going to stop them and they can have the most difficult hardcore experience of all. Hunting as they go, drinking from streams, maybe having little choice but to embrace cannibalism. It'll be a real challenge for them, but I suspect there's plenty that would actually love a Fallout game to be a real challenge. Now these are just ideas. They would need a lot of work and testing and iteration. But my point is, I think it would be a lot more interesting to have a hardcore survival world where people have unique special skills and where communication and trading are more important. Anyway, I'll pick up with my fancy version of Fallout 76 later because we're not done discussing the other side of the weights problem yet. We need to discuss the stash limits. In modern Fallout games, there are various locations that you can make your home, and these homes have always had storage containers in them. This lets you store anything you want to keep, but not carry with you. Fallout 76 had the system too, but with a new twist, the stash box. This is a magic Resident Evil teleporting chest that lets you store or retrieve any item, not just at your base, but at any box scattered throughout the world. Now, this does sound rather useful, but there was a problem with it. At launch, it had a £400 limit, since increased to £600 and now £800. This meant there was effectively a hard cap on how much stuff you could store, and that caused all sorts of problems. Let's just do a quick fire round here. 1. Legendary weapons and armour returned in Fallout 76, but many of the legendary effects are extremely situational. Assassin's gear is literally only useful in PvP, for example, and there are similar variants for ghouls, soup mutants, scorch, robots, bugs, everything, providing more damage or protection in extremely situational circumstances. This means there's a good chance you'll pick up a load of gear that's extremely useful some of the time, but not most of the time. But as weapons and armor weigh so much, it's not really feasible to store them, so you end up dumping potentially valuable legendary gear. 
Two, now that weapons are leveled, you can on occasion find or be awarded weapons you're not able to use yet. So these have to be stored somewhere until you hit the appropriate level, further using up space in the stash box. Three, bobbleheads and magazines have now been changed to be surprisingly heavy consumables. And the magazines, like legendary gear, grant powerful but extremely situational benefits, like 15% bonus against a specific cryptid, bonus damage or damage reduction in PvP, double swim speed, and many other very specific things. So you either use up space storing them, or end up throwing away or selling items that provide very powerful bonuses. 4. As the number of weapons you're modding at any given time tends to be fairly low, certain junk begins to accumulate fast. At level 30, I was sitting on a giant pile of gold and silver that was taking up weight and not doing anything for me, but I didn't want to get rid of it because I knew that one day it would be useful. These days, it's a giant pile of rubber and asbestos I'm sitting on, but I don't dare throw it out in case I need it down the line. In short, there's a lot of stuff that you'll want to put in the stash, and while it has become increasingly manageable as the stash limit has increased, I've still had to throw away stuff I'd rather keep. And I personally find that a bit sad, because I've had to throw away unique quest rewards, and the first legendaries I ever found in the game are all thrown away onto the altar of the stash limit. Back in Fallout 4 Survival Mode, I made a trophy room to display weapons and armour that have been significant in my journey, but that functionality's gone in Fallout 76, so my trophy room has tragically not returned. Now the official reason for this is that Fallout 76 is an online game, and that means the server's trying to deal with loads of people in their inventory simultaneously, so too much stuff would lead to technical problems. This, I think, is a bit of an unsatisfactory answer, because the limit that's imposed on the player is a weight limit, but weight has no intrinsic relationship to the amount of data that's being stored. Technically, 16,000 steel is 800 pounds. That's a full stash. But that's not much data at all. Meanwhile, a single pipe weapon has a weight of four pounds, but that has a level, a max condition, a current condition, a receiver, a barrel, a grip, a sight, a magazine, and a muzzle. That's presumably a lot more data. And there's a very simple solution here. There are only 40 types of base resource in Fallout 76. All the game needs to remember is how many of each that you have. So why does that count towards your stash limit at all? Keep the stash if you must, but resource components should be free. Because even if you have thousands of each resource, it's still just 40 lines in a table with a number against each. That way, the stash can be dedicated to actually interesting things. Now, so far we've been discussing weight in purely literal terms, but there's another side to it as well. Because weight in carry capacity and stash limits is a mechanism that controls how much junk you have and how fast you can gather it. And junk is the true economy of this game. Caps are meaningless, they come and go. But junk does everything. It builds your house, it builds your guns, it builds your armour. Junk is critical. It was in Fallout 4 as well, but in Fallout 76 it's a whole new level. In Fallout 4, you utilise junk primarily to modify your armour and weapons and maintain your power armour, which was the only form of maintenance in the game. It was also used to build your settlements, but settlements also came with their own structures and assets you could demolish to build with, so mostly you didn't need to commit your own junk to that, unless you wanted to make something really fancy. In Fallout 76, the demands on your junk are much higher. Now you need to craft guns from scratch, and thanks to the weapon levelling system, redo that every 10 levels as well. Under the current system, you might also end up mass crafting guns just to scrap them, and your weapon has condition now, so it needs to be maintained. And unlike Fallout 3, you can't repair one weapon with another of the same kind. It needs more advanced components from junk as well. Armour pieces need maintenance too. More junk. Also, you can craft your own ammo now. Junk. And have you seen how much junk building and maintaining power armour costs? Because that went up from Fallout 4. Hugely. So you need a lot more junk. Which makes it very interesting that Bethesda lowered the component yields from many common junk items. For example, in Fallout 4, a desk fan yields two gears, two screws, and two steel. In Fallout 76, that's been lowered to one gear, one screw, and two steel. Typewriters in Fallout 4 offered three gears, two screws, and three springs. In 76, that's down to two gears, one screw, and one spring, and so on like that across many common junk items. Now, there are compensations to these changes, but they're pretty insignificant. In 76, high intelligence is tied to a bonus to scrapping yield, but with so many junk items now yielding just one of each of their components, even with high intelligence, you won't see any benefits. Also, some junk item weights have been reduced, but it's extremely inconsistent. Typewriters are down from £5 to £4, telephones stay the same weight, however, 
In short, the properties of junk items have been modified, so you could carry home slightly more junk than before, but the volume of actual usable components in that junk has been massively reduced. In fact, let's do some maths here. Let's assume that the average weight of junk is about 20% down, but their component yield is 50% down, which seems about fair from what I've seen. That means per pound of junk you haul back to base, you're getting 40% less components next to Fallout 4. Now sure, you can take two ranks of pack rat to offset that and get back to Fallout 4's component to junk weight ratio, but that still means 40% more time looting than Fallout 4. Now that's frustrating, because between slowing down the rate of component harvesting and increasing the need for components, the inevitable conclusion is you have to spend a lot longer looting. And the cogs are back again, because this change has thrown a really big spanner into the Fallout 4 gameplay loop we were discussing at the beginning. You see, in Fallout 4, for most of the game, you were gathering junk to make permanent upgrades to your weapons. In short, if you went out and returned with any junk, you were guaranteed to be in junk profit, and thus closer to your next upgrade. But in Fallout 76, going on a looting trip involves an outlay of materials. Fast travel costs caps now, so you've spent money up front to go to a looting spot, with no idea ahead of time whether or not someone's going to have looted that spot before you got there. Firing guns uses up ammo and gun condition. That gun might need maintenance as a result. Depending on the gun, that could be expensive. And if it uses a rare ammo type, I hope you've got plenty of lead to craft more. And that armor's not going to maintain itself either. Well, unless you've got the perk where your armor magically maintains itself, but you know what I mean. The problem here is that Fallout 76 risks turning us into post-apocalyptic accountants, where we have to try and calculate if a trip is going to be junk profitable because plenty of enemy heavy areas won't be. And you know what the weirdest example of that is? There is no enemy I consider less worth fighting than a Scorch Beast. Yep, the big bad that we have to defeat to save the world is the one enemy I will always resolutely ignore because they just eat junk for no real benefit. Their sonic attacks just chew through armor condition, so especially if you're on your own and thus it's just targeting you, there's a good chance you'll need to pay out significant amounts of junk and repairs at the end of the fight. Plus they're extremely tanky. That's a lot of bullets and gun condition. And what do they give you if you kill them? A fairly minimal amount of XP, some internal organs you can cook which are barely any better than other meat from basic starting area enemies, and some body parts that contain ultracite scrap. But throughout the early and mid game, Ultracite is worthless. As in there are literally no weapons or mods that call for it until the late game. This process makes your first Scorch Beast kill a bit of an anticlimax. And by the late game, when it is useful, I honestly find it faster to just harvest it from the Ultracite or in the Glassed Cavern. But the crucial point is, they don't drop anything unique. By contrast, Skyrim's dragons worked as enemies because if you could kill them, you got a dragon soul, which you couldn't get from anywhere else, and which was immediately useful in the early game, granting access to special unique abilities. But not Scorch Beasts. They cost me junk to fight and don't reward enough to be worth bothering with in return. So I guess I'll just leave the world ending threat be. And so it was that the cogs doomed us all. So why did Fallout 76 change to this system from the one in Fallout 4 if its most immediate consequence was to slow down the game? I think this might be a casualty of the transition from a single player to an online game. Because in a single player game, it's reasonable to assume that if the player does plenty of quests and doesn't rush, they should feasibly be able to access all the biggest, sexiest toys by the end of the game story. That's how Fallout 4 works. Every weapon and armor perk is available by around level 40, easily reachable even if you aren't chasing 100% quest completion. Now that's fine for a single player campaign that might last 30 hours or so, but that doesn't work for an online game which Bethesda have openly stated they want us all to be playing years from now. And people won't be playing in 2020 if they can sit down with the game and within a week have access to every gun, every mod, every item for your camp. When a game wants to be played for years rather than weeks, it has to take a long time to complete. Now there are lots of ways you can make a game last a long time. A compelling competitive multiplayer, high replayability, high difficulty, lots of secrets. But there's another way of course, which MMOs can be particularly susceptible to, and that's grind. And I think that's what weapon scrapping boils down to. It's a deliberately slowed down mechanism of unlocking weapon mods. It also explains why there are so many new and seemingly useless barrel modifications. More stuff to unlock takes more time. 
It's why guns and armor have condition now, and why repair costs for them are so extreme. It all slows the game down. Now to the player, that sounds bad, but from the other side of the fence, it probably sounds good, because a slower game keeps people logging in every day. It's habit forming, and that's definitely something that Bethesda have in mind, because that's exactly why the Daily Asim challenges exist, to get you logging in every day. It's very likely the same reason why junk yields are lower these days. It's why Scrapper, which used to provide useful uncommon resources, now barely makes any difference at all. It's also, I think, why leveled weapons exist, because... Honestly, they probably shouldn't. We've never needed them before in Fallout, and what do they really add? Sure, it lets guns become more powerful as you level up, but we already have weapon-specific mods locked behind level-gated perks that make guns more powerful, together with damage-boosting perks that you unlock as you level up too. We don't need a third system to make guns get more powerful as you level up. And while there's not much apparent benefit, there are major downsides. Giving certain weapons hard-coded minimum level requirements to use them creates all sorts of problems. For one, it just doesn't make any sense that an experienced revolver user can't use a particular type of revolver until one precise arbitrary moment and then they just can. It leads to quest rewards that you physically can't use, which happened to me with the voice of Set, which I received about 15 levels before I was allowed to use it. And, most pressing of all, Fallout already had a better system. In Fallout New Vegas, you can try to use any weapon you wish, but if you don't meet the requirements in strength or skill, it's very hard to use well. The sights sway like crazy, and the swing speed of melee weapons is low. Now that's a great system, because it creates a natural and organic improvement in weapon performance over time. As you invest in the appropriate skill, the weapon slowly becomes easier to use. Whereas in 76, at level 29, you can't use the weapon at all, and at level 30, you're a master with your first shot. And this is such an easy fix to strip out all weapon levels, adjust the weapon base damage, weapon damage perks and weapon mods to compensate and embrace letting players use wildly inappropriate weapons incredibly badly. In fact, let's take this further. Let's bring back critical failures. This was a system back in old Fallout where things could go very, very badly wrong. You could shoot your ally by mistake, stab yourself in the foot, drop your weapon, all sorts of things. So I say, let that level two player try to use whatever weapon they wish, as long as they can accept the consequences of, for example, trying to use a missile launcher without a single heavy gunner perk. And we could have some real fun with this. Kick back so strong it does damage and cripples their arms, maybe even knocking them off their feet. Weapon jams, swinging sights, misfires, dropping the clip when you're trying to reload, just straight up falling over under the weight of the weapon. It's more organic, it's more fun, and it's got a strong Fallout pedigree. And while I'm stripping out systems, what about weapon and armor maintenance? You see, the big question I try and ask about any game mechanic is, how does this make the game more fun or interesting? Because back in Fallout 3, maintenance did have a purpose. Weapon condition was directly linked to damage, and most weapons were found or bought in less than perfect condition. Put simply, a repair specialist could get a weapon to a higher condition than you might be able to acquire from anywhere else, resulting in higher damage. It was a viable approach to combat, being the guy who showed up with the best condition gun. But in Fallout 76, I don't know what the benefit is. Sure, you can invest heavily in intelligence and take weapon artisan and own weapons with 200% max condition, but that doesn't have any benefit as far as I can see. A weapon boost of beyond max condition seems to do exactly the same damage as one in low condition. So as far as I can tell, thorough maintenance doesn't give you any benefit. It just means you get to ignore maintenance for longer. Meanwhile, over in luck, there are perks to make weapons and armor have a chance to maintain themselves. And the moment we have multiple perks that exist purely so the player doesn't have to bother with a game mechanic as much, then maybe that game mechanic shouldn't be there. Maintenance, I fear, is just another system designed to be a junk hoover. Design weapons that break regularly to force players to loot for even more junk. It feels suspiciously like grind by design. So my first instinct is to just get rid of it. Go back to Fallout 4 system where weapons don't have condition. But perhaps we can do something more interesting than that. After all, in my Fallout 76, we don't bring guns back to base to scrap them. So what if we use them for day-to-day -day maintenance instead? If you find a shotgun out in the world and you're using the same shotgun, the quick loot menu could prompt you to maintain an instantaneous action that removes that weapon from the world and restores a bit of the condition of your own weapon. 
Naturally, we can have perks to make field maintenance more effective, maybe jury rigging could return to allow any kind of pistol to repair any other say, but all this field maintenance should only be able to get your weapon to 100% condition. At a proper workbench, you can still use specialist perks to boost weapons to beyond full condition, and you should be rewarded for doing that. Improved accuracy, improved range, improved damage. The reason I like this system is that it introduces a tactical choice into junk use. Sure, you probably can just keep your guns in working order with basic field maintenance. Or you could choose to spend your junk on a full tune-up and have the benefits of an extremely powerful weapon for a time. You're choosing to invest junk into a buff rather than being forced to spend it by a timer. So those are a couple of ideas I think we could use to make crafting and maintenance a lot more interesting, while still maintaining the need to gather junk to some degree. Unfortunately, I think Bethesda's actually taking this further in the wrong direction at the moment. Licensed Plumber and White Knight used to hugely reduce the amount of junk needed to maintain pipe weapons and armor respectively. As a result, many people took these perks. So many that, like I mentioned before, Bethesda took note and weakened them in the end of January patch. Now to my mind, this is backwards thinking. If you've added in weapon and armor maintenance to your game, and a huge number of people have chosen to upgrade their characters to do as little maintenance as possible, then the solution is not to change the upgrade system to forcibly increase maintenance requirements. It's to ask, did we make a mistake? Is the community not enjoying maintenance? Is it too much? Should it be there at all? So why did Bethesda nerf White Knight and Licensed Plumber, rather than taking their high usage as a clear sign something's not right with the current state of the maintenance mechanism? Well, here we get to one of the biggest underlying factors in many of Fallout 76's design decisions, which I've briefly touched on already. The problem of converting a single player game into a multiplayer one. There is perhaps a reason that immediately after confirming Fallout 76 was an online game, Todd Howard reassured everyone that you could play it solo anyway. First, of course you can play this solo, alright? That statement is an excellent demonstration of arguably one of the biggest problems that any online Fallout multiplayer will inevitably face. Fallout has always been a single player experience. Even next to other single player games, it's a particularly single player experience. The setting is a blasted wasteland, covered in empty homes and ruins, with some games in the franchise, Fallout 3 in particular, leaning into that setting and embracing an atmosphere of desolate, haunting loneliness. You literally play as the Lone Wanderer, the sole survivor, the chosen one. Taking that franchise and turning it into an online multiplayer live service was always going to be tricky. And I suspect this is why there wasn't the same level of backlash against the Elder Scrolls Online. Sure, the Elder Scrolls was single player up to that point, but it didn't have this idea of the single survivor alone in the waste at its core. And so we get to the compromise. Fallout 76 is a radical online reimagining of Fallout that does things no other Fallout game has done that could appeal to a brand new audience. But the existing Fallout community is primarily composed of fans of single player action RPGs and also features a significant group who already think that the most recent Fallout games aren't RPG enough. And that means that the online multiplayer survival game also has to appeal to single player action RPG fans. Now is trying to make this compromise work an impossible task? Maybe, maybe not. But I think this context is very important for understanding how Fallout 76 ends up the way it did. Let me give you an example. It's time to talk about survival. Fallout as a franchise has a very odd relationship with survival mechanics. Thirst and Hunger have always been there, in the background. Fallout is a universe where even if you don't need to eat and drink, everybody else does, and it's the driving force behind many of the game's plots. Fallout 1 kicks off because the vault is terrified that it's running out of water. Fallout 2's inciting incident is the threat of famine caused by dying crops and livestock. Fallout 3 is all about providing clean water to the world, and multiple major settlements have a man sitting outside them begging for clean water because rans from untreated water are making him sick. Fallout New Vegas was the game that finally embraced these mechanics and brought them into the game, but only in the optional hardcore mode that the game explicitly stated wasn't a recommended part of the default play experience. 
Fallout 4 then went even deeper with its survival mode, adding in not just food and water, but also disease and various gameplay rebalancers to create a more brutal experience. But again, this was really an extra hard side mode, added in post-launch and not really considered part of the default experience. My point is, Fallout 76 finally bringing the survival mechanics into the default game experience didn't surprise me, and I don't think it's a bad idea at all. A post-apocalypse setting is a natural fit for survival, and trying to find a way to survive in a hostile wasteland is a common Fallout theme. Even better, this is something that Bethesda had had a trial run at already. They'd done survival modes in Fallout 4 and Skyrim, probably learnt a lot from that, had a chance to gather player feedback, Maybe this was even the plan all along. Use Fallout 4 survival mode as a testing ground for ideas that could potentially become part of the main game in 76. And there is honestly a really good game concept right here, because I loved Fallout 4 survival mode. And what made it work was that it embraced survival, and reworked the entire game to suit being a brutal, hardcore survival experience. You see, a survival game isn't just about drinking water and eating food occasionally. It's about, you know, surviving. For that to mean anything, then there has to be a chance of not surviving. Giving someone a food meter is meaningless if food is plentiful. In fact, it's worse than meaningless. It's just additional faff. This, I think, is why New Vegas is often regarded as one of the best games of all time, but nobody ever really talks about hardcore mode. Because in New Vegas, food and water and beds are everywhere. So eating and drinking and sleeping isn't a question of surviving, it's just a chore that slows down the game. It's also interesting that New Vegas' J. Sawyer mod significantly reduced the amount of purified water and food available in the world, suggesting the state of hardcore mode in the New Vegas base game was likely a consequence of the short development time, and had they had longer to work on it, it might well have come to look more like Fallout 4 survival mode did. And in Fallout 4 survival mode, the question of whether or not you can survive is real. Perhaps the most important change is that all forms of manual saving are disabled. Instead, you save by sleeping in an owned bed. This makes the game incredibly tense. Survival mode also disabled fast travel, so you had to plan trips carefully, as you couldn't just warp home if you ran out of water. And then there was the adrenaline system. As you killed enemies, adrenaline went up and you did more damage. But sleeping, which was the only way to save, reset your adrenaline to zero. Oh, and the compass effective range was massively reduced, so you couldn't see nearby landmarks and the red ticks of enemies didn't show up at all. So you set off from your base with food and water to explore Boston, but maybe you take a wrong turn somewhere because you don't have any of those helpful compass markers to guide you. You fight off a few enemies, your adrenaline is rising, your damage output is high. You can hear there are enemies nearby, but without the compass you have no idea where they are precisely. Food and drink is getting low because this trip is taking longer than you thought and then you find a sleeping bag. You could drop a save, but you'll lose your adrenaline, and you're still not 100% sure where you actually are. Yeah, Fallout 4 Survival Mode was amazing, and if you've never played it, I strongly recommend it. It's a completely different experience to the base game. And the key to its success was, to my mind, that it embraced survival and accepted that that meant a game which was tense, difficult, nerve-wracking on occasion, something close to a survival horror experience. And that could have been amazing with friends. But then we hit the compromise. Up to this point, Fallout had never had survival mechanics as part of the default experience, which means many existing Fallout players might not have been familiar with them. And Fallout 4 survival mode was brutally difficult even for experienced players, which could have been off-putting to newcomers. And so it was that most of the things that made Fallout 4 survival mode work were stripped away, leaving Fallout 76 in a bit of an odd position. A survival game where the survival mechanics have basically no chance of threatening your survival. This is perhaps the best example of the danger of compromise. When it came to survival mechanics, Fallout 76 tried to please everyone and ended up pleasing nobody. Let's examine precisely what went wrong though. As we've just been discussing, a crucial factor in a survival mechanic is scarcity. The thing you need to survive has to be somewhat hard to find, otherwise it's just a chore, as was the case in the default New Vegas Hardcore mode. And in Fallout 76, there is basically zero scarcity. Water is everywhere. You begin the game with the ability to build a water purifier, so you've got purified water straight away. It spawns regularly in first aid boxes. The overseer has little stashes all over the wasteland, and those just generate free food and water. But worst of all, it just magically appears, because the quest rewards in this game are odd. Because many quests are generated from you reading notes or listening to audio logs from deceased people, 
there's no quest giver to hand out the rewards. So they just sort of appear out of thin air. And purified water is a very common thing to receive. Food has a different weird problem, which is advanced cookery in Fallout 76 is completely pointless. This one really bugs me, because when I heard there were loads of recipes in Fallout 76, I immediately knew I wanted to take any perk card I could find related to cooking, locate a chef's hat, and become a master chef. But there's just no point. Let me give you an example. If you can find the recipe for it, which by the way is located in a late game area, you can cook the cram burger. Just mix one boiled water, one serving of cram, two Mylar eggs and two potatoes and voila, one cram burger, which gives you 20 extra carry weight, restores 60 hit points and fills 20% of your hunger meter. Or you could kill a rad stag, which can be found within 30 seconds of the start of the game, cook that meat with no extra ingredients without any recipe, which will get you... 20 extra carry weight, 60 hit points, and 20% of your hunger meter. Literally identical. Or, if your priority was just filling up your hunger meter, you can take the ingredients of the cram burger and eat them individually to get a better result. The cram alone is worth 15% of your food meter. The two eggs can become omelettes for 10% food each. In fact, they're actually 10% food each even if uncooked if you don't care about disease risk, which you probably shouldn't because disease cures are extremely common. Then you add in the potatoes and the boiled water and the ingredients of the cram burger are worth, combined, 45% of your hunger meter and 15% thirst as well, thanks to the boiled water. And this happens a lot. Cooking food actively makes it worse. And some of the first animals and plants you come across and their auto-unlocked basic recipes are the best stuff in the game. Say you want to boost perception. Sweetwater Special Blend is a consumable you have to complete a quest to unlock. And then to craft it, you need boiled water, bourbon, blood leaf and honey. Or you can go and find a pumpkin. There's a pile of them just down the road from the start of the game. Mix that with boiled water, no recipe needed, and that's also plus two perception. Only 18% first, but it also comes with 12% food, so better overall. Even when there are benefits to cooking, they're incredibly minor. You can prepare a dog steak for two boiled water, two mongrel meat, two mute fruit, and two salt for plus three endurance, or just take a single one of those mongrel meats and grill it for plus two endurance. All you really need is dog and rad stag for the entire game, which makes it very convenient that if you fast travel to Flatwoods, three dogs spawn immediately behind you with a rad stag nearby, and more mole rats, chickens, and brahmin ahead if you need even more meat. And this is how I ultimately dealt with hunger. Every time I got hungry, I just travelled to Flatwoods, because everything you will ever need is right there in the tutorial town. This also has a knock-on effect to character building. You see, in the early game, all the endurance perks are related to survival mechanics, making early game endurance pretty much useless, because I've had to dump purified water, because I had so much of it that it was weighing me down, and the stash limit meant that I couldn't store it. This was a problem I ran into myself. I wanted to take a couple of extra points of endurance for the extra hit points, but I didn't because the early game endurance survival perk cards are so much worse than what every other special stat offers. This is a really easy fix by the way. Just move some of the weapon type perks out of strength over to endurance. For some reason strength perk cards include unarmed, melee, shotgun and heavy guns. Why are four weapon types tied to strength but none to endurance? Just move unarmed and heavy gunner perks to endurance. Anyway, my point is, this is the opposite of scarcity. This is abundance. The game is asking us to keep a couple of meters topped up in a world where the resources needed to do so are literally everywhere. And that there is the danger of compromise. They wanted to add in survival mechanics, but didn't dare have them in a form that might prove difficult to manage, presumably out of concern that they might be frustrating to some players. But they're frustrating anyway. Having to babysit survival meters where acquiring the relevant resources simplicity is just, unfortunately, another way in which the game has been slowed down. Acquiring food isn't a challenge, it's just a bit of extra grind. When it comes to survival mechanics, it's probably best to either embrace it fully and create a brutal experience where survival is a real challenge, like Fallout 4 survival modes early and mid game, or just remove it completely like every previous Fallout base game, because uh, in its current form, it's pretty much just faff. Now, so far we've been talking about survival in strict terms of hunger and thirst, but there's more to it than that. As I've said before, for survival to mean anything, there's gotta be a chance you don't survive. The possibility of failure is important. Fallout 76 runs into problems here, 
some by design and some as a consequence of technical decisions. You see, tension and fear are really powerful emotions for games, especially survival and horror games. And mechanical decisions that games make can heavily impact how strongly we do or don't feel those emotions. To give you an example, in Fallout 4 there's an area called the Glowing Sea. It's a very nicely distinct biome, a murky, lonely, alien hellscape with low visibility and also potentially the first time you run into various monstrous enemies. I think it's a really cool bit of design work, but I was never scared when exploring it until I played on survival mode, because taking away your ability to save or navigate effectively feels oppressive. My point is that certain mechanical choices or restrictions can reinforce or undermine the atmosphere that an area is aiming to evoke. Fallout 76's equivalent to the Glowing Sea is the Ash Heap, a grim, ash-covered nightmare where just being in the area without the appropriate breathing gear can make you sick from the toxic air. There's no water here and no animals either. It's desolate, it's occupied by twisted, snarling humanoids, sometimes scorched beasts circle overhead, and if you enter the mine shafts, the aesthetic they're going for is pretty obvious. You're supposed to feel like you're descending into hell. If you've been following the plot meanwhile, this is the first time you'll leave the lush green forest with its plentiful food and water. In a survival game, this should be a slightly scary moment. But it's not at all because of the various choices that Fallout 76 has made. The first is how death works, which is that death has basically zero consequences. You don't lose any XP, or progress, or gear, ammo, weapons, anything. All you do is drop your junk, which you can just go and grab, because the game generously allows you to respawn at any location of your choice, and immediately continue. This means that brute forcing is a perfectly valid tactic. If you just keep throwing yourself at a group of enemies long enough, you'll win sooner or later. None of this ever really came up for me, even though I played the entire campaign up to the final fight solo. It was all very manageable by myself on my first go. This is another side of the single player multiplayer compromise I suspect. The game's difficulty is balanced to ensure that a single player can complete the game alone without it being frustrating, meaning that when I did travel around with a team, the game felt extremely easy. And as for the other things that might make the game a bit more tricky, if you forget to bring food or water, don't worry. Unlike New Vegas' hardcore mode or Fallout 4 survival mode, you don't start to feel slowly increasing negative effects as hunger and thirst set in. Instead, you're absolutely fine until the hunger and thirst meters are down to their last 25%, so the game's perfectly happy for you to totally ignore its own survival mechanics 75% of the time. And when you do finally hit that bottom 25%, don't worry. Fast travel is not only enabled, it's the most generous iteration of fast travel possible, as it's instantaneous. And thus, unlike fast travel in Fallout New Vegas Hardcore mode, you don't gain any additional hunger or thirst while fast travelling. So you can just teleport back to Flatwoods, grab some fresh food, drink some water, and teleport straight back out to the Nightmare Hellscape to continue. But if you don't fancy that, don't worry. Thanks to the new camp system, you can bring your base to you. So you can summon in a house, water purifier, crops, a cooking station, your stash box, a bed, even turrets to protect you. Now, I don't think the mobile camp is a bad idea, but I do think this is a really good example of those cogs in action. A survival-focused Fallout game is a perfectly good idea, and a Fallout game where Fallout 4 settlement system is upgraded to allow you to build anywhere is a perfectly good idea. But a survival game, and a mechanism that lets you magically summon in a base with access to food and water at just about any time, those two things are pretty fundamentally incompatible. Now this is a really big topic, so I'll discuss the camp in its own section, but for now, I'll say that I think it's great we can build a home wherever we want, but the ability to routinely call up your camp to you undermines the survival mechanics so absolutely that changes have to be made to make it less viable to just summon a giant house and all its amenities to you. For now though, we need to move on to a mechanic that lives hand in hand with survival, and that is difficulty. As I said during the last section, failure is a really important part of a game. When we're talking about difficulty in games, what we're often really saying is, how high is the chance that I could fail or die, and how severe are the consequences for that failure? Are you sent back to the beginning of the level? Maybe there are regular auto checkpoints. Some games have Iron Man permadeath modes, where death is the end of that save file. Are you penalised for death? Do you lose XP? Do you come back weaker? Fallout 76 goes for a rather extreme position here, it has some of the most generous death mechanics I can think of. 
The game's difficulty is already pitched fairly low. When out of health, you have a grace period for other players to revive you. There's a legendary gear type that lets you resurrect yourself when you're on the ground. Some players have reported that Born Survivor, a perk that auto uses a stim pack if you're under 20% health, can trigger while you're down, though this may be a bug. And even if you do die, you can respawn straight away in the immediate area with no penalty aside from the dropped junk you can immediately grab. And this is one of the biggest overall changes I would make to Fallout 76. It needs to be harder. A lot harder. And let's be precise here, I think the game needs an exponential difficulty curve. Because right now, this game is really weird in that regard. I've said it's easy, and it is, with survival and death mechanics so generous that hunger, thirst, and death itself are effectively non-considerations in the game. Lone players can brute force their way through anything simply enough. Right up to the point where you hit the final mission, at which point the game hits you with the most insane difficulty spike I think I've ever seen in a game. Up to this point, the most complicated puzzles in Fallout 76 are perhaps the multiple choice fire safety quiz, in Charleston, where you have to search the firehouse for documents that hint at the answers, and the patriotism exam in Camp McClintock, which involves some simple combinations of speaking to NPCs, reading notes and reading terminals. Most of the time, Fallout 76 isn't interested in puzzles. The quest marker guides you through the game instead. And then... In order to launch the nuke, you need a numeric launch code. The game gives you a password made up of letters and points out code fragments that associate letters with numbers. Sounds nice and easy, eh? No, it's not what you're thinking. You don't just convert the password to numbers by finding the code fragment pieces. That doesn't work. Instead, the game gives you one lead to follow, which informs you there's a cipher, but nobody knows what it is. That is literally all the information you are given in-game. What you are supposed to do is take the letters in the password that the game gave you and remove them from the alphabet, and now form a new rearranged alphabet with the password at the beginning and the remaining letters following. Now you take the code fragments you had and convert the letters on them into different letters by laying the new alphabet alongside the old one. So now you have eight new random letters. Those eight letters are actually an anagram, so now make a word out of that. So that word now has to be converted into numbers. By taking the new arrangement of letters, converting it back to the newly rearranged code fragment letters, and then using the code fragment pieces to turn that into an eight digit code. And that is the code you need to launch a nuke. And the game tells you none of that. Hilariously, almost nobody seems to know this. It's so random and unexplained that most people just go online and find the code at the start of each week when it changes. I've spoken to level 100 players who have launched multiple nukes who have no idea how to work out their own codes. Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent, but the endgame code cracking really baffles me. Now, the map in Fallout 76 is very conveniently divided up into six distinct biomes. Now, this can be useful because it's a good way of indicating to new players that as long as they stay inside the forest, they should be mostly safe. So I'd say the current difficulty in the forest is fine. In fact, the forest region in general is a decent enough introduction to the game. Plenty of food, plenty of water, keep things easy for new players, absolutely. The problem is what happens when you leave the forest. It should be a major step up. There's a bleached, toxic expanse to the north, and a grey, burnt, smoking wasteland to the south. New players should fear these areas. Entering them for the first time should be such an immediate increase in difficulty that you could die a few times while still learning about the new enemies and locations. But there's a more important shift I'd like to make here. These areas shouldn't just be more difficult, they should be more distinct. Because right now, they're very aesthetically distinct. In fact, in terms of having some really well-designed biomes, I'd say it's up there with Skyrim as one of my favourite worlds in a Bethesda game. But in terms of gameplay, the different areas feel too similar. So let's talk about how we can modify the map to create a world that's more difficult and more interesting. Now at this point, I'm going to start throwing out some slightly wild ideas. So forgive me for the following Fallout 76 fanfiction. But this is how I might make each area of the map work. Now I really like the idea of the ash heap. But then I realised that if you wrap a bandana around your face, you're immediately immune to all of the negative effects in the area, so it's basically just a reskin version of the forest. And I think we can do better than that. The area is supposed to be choking under clouds of ash that automated mines are churning into the air. So let's use that to create unique difficulties. 
In the mines themselves, thick smoke reduces visibility. So I'd say let's put that across the entire area. And let's disable your compass to create the feeling of being lost and disorientated in the smoke. You've got your map, sure, but while you're in the smoke, you're not marked on it. You have no idea where you are. You'll have to navigate from landmark to landmark. And we're not done yet either. Remember the fog crawler from Far Harbor? That was a really cool idea. A monster in the fog that was scariest when you couldn't see it. So I'd introduce a new enemy, the ash crawler. It stalks you, follows you. You can hear it chittering away in the smoke, but it stays out of sight. Oh, and Vats won't be able to penetrate this smoke to find it either. Vats range will be reduced to match up with visibility in this area. And even though you know it's there, the ash crawler doesn't attack yet. It might though, if it senses an opportunity, if you or one of your team is weakened by other enemies, it might attack you right when you're most vulnerable. And as time goes by, more of its friends show up. The noise gets louder. Maybe they start getting more confident and a few of them attack just to see how they do, retreating after giving you a prod if you fight back. But now you know they're angry and they're coming and it's just going to get worse every second you're in the smoke. Of course, in my version of Fallout 76, I want to reward investment in varied playstyles. So we could say that if you've invested in Sneak, they gather more slowly. Maybe they gather faster if you make a bunch of noise. But eventually, when there's enough of them, they will attack in full. But only when they think they can win. Now, mechanically speaking, the idea of the Ash Crawler serves a few purposes. Firstly, they're an organic time limit. Staying in the ash heap is dangerous, and eventually you either flee or face an extremely tough fight. Second, they also work to reinforce the desired atmosphere of the biome, one of being lost and scared in the smoke. Navigating without a map and compass will be a shock to players used to a lovely quest marker telling them where to go, as will the added stress of being hunted. And third, the Ash Heap is actually a fairly small area. Shrouding it in smoke and making navigation a nightmare would make it and the world feel bigger. Moving on, the Toxic Valley is a bit of a difficult one because the Toxic Valley in general is a really weird area. Like how the main plot never sends you there and despite being fairly small, it's still pretty empty. I could potentially see the advantage of removing it from the game entirely and moving the forest further north to give room to expand the ash heap. But let's assume it stays, because I did have one idea to at least make it a bit more interesting to navigate. So Fallout 76 introduced this dynamic weather system. It's actually really cool. You can see rainstorms moving across the map and it's actually raining for players under them. They are, however, underutilized. So how about this? The Toxic Valley, being a dumping ground for toxic chemicals, is constantly plagued by acid storms. These storms visibly move around the map and you don't want to get caught in them. Just being in the vicinity means you start taking rads, rads that get worse as the storm gets closer. And the storm, of course, moves just a little bit faster than you can sprint. So you'd better keep an eye on it, figure out what direction it's moving in and get out of its way. But if you do get caught inside the acid storm, you'll be taking damage over time constantly and you're not alone either because some creatures have evolved to live inside the storm, the corrosive death claws. But of course, like the ash crawler can't leave the smoke, they can't leave the storm either. So if you do get caught inside, maybe just find a place to hide and wait for it to pass you over. This isn't my favourite idea, but it does at least give the Toxic Valley something distinctive aside from its aesthetic. And it might be nice to have some rare materials exclusively available in the storm so that some mad bastards go on expeditions inside it. Moving on to the next region, I think the Savage Divide in particular, a huge mountain range that separates the east and the west of the map, is a wasted opportunity. It should be a nightmare so that becoming strong enough to break through it and make it to the far side of the mountains is a huge achievement. If only because that's what the game story says the Savage Divide should be. All the lore says it's a heavily occupied nightmare, swarming with super mutants, raiders and monsters, which could only be safely crossed by large convoys with Brotherhood escorts. In fact, there's a lot in the lore about this region we could actually use. The game specifically says that the reason nobody assaults the raider bases there is because they've set up defences, manned barricades, sniper nests, that sort of thing. And yet in the game, we don't see much of that, and some of the defences we do see aren't manned. 
I'd say make this area super mutant central, as they were supposed to be one of the major threats to crossing the Savage Divide. Make trying to get into the mountains like an uphill assault against a super mutant army. I want roving patrols, mutants with missile launchers on the towers. I want behemoths on the road. I want suicider ambushes coming out of the tree cover. If, that is, you try direct assault at all. Because I think it should be potentially just as viable to try and sneak through at night. You'd still need to take down a lot of mutants through silenced weapons, melee sneak attacks, maybe even decoys, but it should be doable that way as well. As for the Maya, the story says there's out of control mutated plant growth in the region, possibly caused by a Voltic experiment gone wrong. And yet in the game, you see only the odd handful of stranglevine infested enemies. I think the idea of a heavily overgrown swamp that's been completely consumed by a virulent hive mind growth is the perfect area for non-stop waves of enemies throwing themselves at you. A zombie horde of strangler-infested foes that never stop coming. But, being plants, can be scared off by fire. So you can fight if you want, or just desperately try to keep them at bay with enough flame weapons as you rush to your next destination. At first, maybe it's just strangler ferals and strangler mole rats. Easy stuff for most characters. But as you stay longer, and the hive mind starts to panic, expect the enemies to get worse and worse until Strangler Deathclaws and Strangler Myalurk Queens are hunting you down. Now in case you hadn't noticed, the one thing I really want to do here is have each biome feel distinct. The Maya is a fast-paced bloodbath, the Ash Heap is a tense survival horror standoff, the Toxic Valley calls for planning around an unstoppable slow-moving natural force, while the Savage Divide is a military assault. And that brings us to the final area, the Cranberry Bog. And to my mind, no player, no matter what level, should just be strolling around the Cranberry Bog. This is the final area of the game. It's got more Fisher Sights than the rest of the map combined. Fisher Sight Prime is right there. This is literally the Scorch Beast home. And right in the middle of it, you've got Watoga, the most advanced automated city in the world. And I think this place should be a total war zone. Constant Scorch Beast circling overhead but they're not just interested in you. The robots of Watoga are constantly spawning in and charging out of the city to defend it. It's a never-ending battle between monsters and robots, between Scorched and the wildlife, between the automated Brotherhood turrets and anything that comes into their range. When you get to the Cranberry Bog, you run for your objective and hope that not that much gets in your way. So all of that is about making each area distinct, unique, and much more difficult. Or, at the bare minimum, in need of a specialised approach beyond shoot all the things with my highest damage gun. And while we're talking about the map, I did have one other idea. This one's a bit extreme, and I don't think it would necessarily work, but still. We could Morrowind defy Fallout 76. Kill the map. Compass markers at extreme short range only, no quest markers at all. So how would this sort of thing theoretically work? Well, let's take the final departure quest. In Flatwoods, you get told to head north to the Morgantown Airport. Well, you can use your compass to find north, you know, like an actual compass is supposed to be used for, and then follow the road north out of town. On the way, look for road signs. Locations are actually very well signed in Fallout 76. And maybe once you get near to the location, you can have a quest marker to guide you to the exact right spot. This would of course need a total rewrite of much of the game's script and audio logs that pertain to quests, as now they need to give you instructions and directions you can follow. But what I like about this is, it would encourage players to communicate. Because if you're not sure where something is, you'll need to ask other players for directions. This would also mean more players navigating by easy to follow routes, like roads and train lines, providing more high traffic areas to potentially set small camps up for people who want to try and trade. But most of all, it frees us from the tyranny of the quest marker, that little bastard that we have all spent far too many years running directly at. But to be honest, that one's more of a thought experiment. I think that might be going a bit far. Anyway, as for the map as we have it right now, I have visited, I believe, every location on the map solo and played every event solo. And I don't recall any area or dungeon representing a major issue, aside from some lower level encounters where particularly large packs of super mutants stretch my ammo and explosive supplies a bit. 
In fact, to me, it feels like Bethesda pitched the difficulty quite low even in the later areas to create an experience of broadly the same difficulty as, say, Fallout 4 on normal or hard. Now that's an acceptable difficulty when there's one human on the map and AI companions of variable usefulness, sitting on a sliding scale with Ian repeatedly murdering me with my own guns on one end and Craig bloody hell leave one for me Boone at the other. But for me this low difficulty is connected to one of Fallout 76's biggest problems specifically as an online game. The players aren't having meaningful interactions with each other. If you really ramp up the difficulty, players are more likely to cooperate. Imagine a world where four low-level players join forces to try and cross the Savage Divide together. Imagine a world where there were roaming bands of enemies so tough and so numerous that cautiously scouting a new area was a good idea, and where you might decide that retreating or sneaking around an enemy group was the right idea, or an enemy force guarding an objective was so tough that one member acting as a decoy to draw off some of the enemy while the remainder stormed the back entrance together was the best bet where stealth and silenced weapons were good ideas. In short, a world where running in all guns blazing only gets you so far, and where varied and creative tactics could work better. Of course, running in all guns blazing will always be a viable tactic when you can immediately respawn and rejoin the fight. So for death mechanics, I think that death should send you back to the last camp you visited, even if it wasn't yours, just the last time you encountered some form of civilization. And to work alongside that, I'd also add in some restrictions to make moving your camp around, and thus just summoning it to you, less viable, or at least more expensive, though I'll discuss that in detail later. I'm getting into specifics here, I want to get back to the wider point. If Fallout 76 is going to be an online multiplayer game, and it is, that's not going to change, then, like I've discussed, it's inevitable that Bethesda are going to want to make the game last a long time. That's just the model of these things. But when we take some of the conclusions and observations I've made so far together, we get a bit of a contradictory picture. I'd say it seems extremely likely that the game's junk economy has been modified to slow down progress, and yet game difficulty in general is quite low. Call me crazy, but why don't we just pull some of these levers in opposite directions and see if we end up with a more interesting experience. And this is where my version of Fallout 76 starts to come together. You see, I've already decided that weapon and armour maintenance consumes less junk, and the removal of levelled weapons reduces the need to craft. But remember, I've also taken some carry weight off you, so you won't be swimming in junk either. I just aim to slightly reduce the amount of looting needed to function effectively. So in terms of Fallout 76's length, I've just sped up the game pace by removing some of the grind. So now, we pull the other lever. More enemies, more difficulty, some radically different challenges in each biome, calling for more preparation, more teamwork, better tactics. Okay, that's now slowed the game down again, but the key thing here is the substitution I just made. In my version of Fallout 76, you spend less time gathering junk, scrapping weapons, maintaining armour. In short, you spend less time looking at menus and running through low-level areas that have reliable junk. And I am very tired of running through Morgantown High School collecting plastic pumpkins. And instead, you're spending more time engaged in difficult fights, scouting out enemy positions, modifying your loadout to suit the unique threat you're about to face. This strikes me as a simple choice. If you could choose between a game that takes a long time to complete because of grind, or a game that takes a long time to complete because of difficulty, which would you prefer? I'm oversimplifying here, of course. There's lots of decisions and creative methods to make a game last longer, and some of these are fairly simple conceptually, if not always easy to execute. Let me begin with a counterexample. Remember the combat zone in Fallout 4? It was actually in one of the game's trailers, with the player standing right in front of the cage, watching the fight. It looked like it might function like the Thorn in New Vegas, a place where you could go, bet on fights, maybe fight in the arena yourself. It looked cool and interesting, but that's not what happens in the game. People who dug around in the game files found unused areas and dialogue that clearly indicated it was supposed to work like that at one point, but for unknown reasons it was cut before launch and never restored. Instead, you go in, everybody shoots at you, and you kill them. That's a wasted opportunity right there, where an area that could be something different and interesting instead just serves as another room full of raiders to shoot. Fallout 4 has a few of these unfortunately underutilised areas. The robot racetrack at Easy City Downs is a prominent example. 
but Fallout 76 is absolutely full of them. The gun range at Clarksburg doesn't function as a gun range. The Mistress of Mystery headquarters has a Batman training room that doesn't work. There's a water park with slides that you can't ride. White Springs features a golf course that you can't play golf on. There are multiple fairgrounds where you can't play any of the carnival games and none of the rides can ever be repaired, which is especially disappointing after Nuka Worlds. In a perfect world, these areas would do something. Gun ranges would feature competitive scorekeeping. Carnivals could be restored to working order. This represents a huge amount of ongoing work, of course, but it would make the world so much more interesting and distinct. And once players get used to the idea that areas hide these fun little extra secrets, people will explore more thoroughly, more slowly. It'll make the game last longer without having to resort to grinds. In fact, more generally, there are a lot of areas in Fallout 76 that feel underdeveloped. You see, I reckon there's a recipe for a decent Fallout area. It should be a visually distinct and interesting area, which offers two layers of storytelling and a reward for visiting it. What I mean is, Fallout locations have two lives. What was happening before the bombs fell, and what was happening immediately before you turned up today. And sometimes, those two stories can interact. Take Helios 1 in New Vegas. The immediate story is that the NCR wants you to increase the power output by fighting your way past some robots. The pre-war story, which you can entirely miss if you're rushing through, is that the building was designed to power a secret satellite weapon, which was being tested in front of military personnel shortly before the war. Dig into that, and one of the characters there today will reward you for covering up that fact. Or you can claim the weapon for yourself. Two stories, layered on top of each other, interacting with each other in interesting ways, with a choice of rewards at the end depending on how you resolve the situation. Now this is an important bit of design, because a compelling story can make a small area really interesting and encourage the player to explore it fully, to discover what's going on or what did happen long ago. Now let me tell you the story of a location in Fallout 76, Barclay Springs. It's a town in the Mire, a decent sized settlement with a large reservoir, a spa, a hotel, a building that looks like a castle, a town hall, a clinic, and various apartments. Naturally, I assumed that an area this size would have something interesting going on, so I started exploring, and I came across a few terminals, and very interestingly, two of them mentioned General Atomic's robot strangely malfunctioning. And I also found some satellite dishes hidden around the town. Intriguing, I thought. A mystery to solve. What dastardly secret does this town hold? What experiment was being done? The answer's nothing. It doesn't go anywhere. The dishes are just there for the dropped connection event. If the event's live, you go up to them and you press A. And some robots just malfunctioned, I guess. It's not explained at all. But this all struck me as very weird at first, because a lot of effort has been put into this town. There are buildings with interiors that aren't used for anything. Terminals and stories that don't go anywhere. It's just a really weirdly underutilised area. And it's not alone. There are a whole lot of areas that seem strangely empty when you find them, because of a slightly odd choice by Fallout 76, that if an area is the site of an event, a type of temporary quest that all players present can collaborate on, then that should be all that happens there. The problem with that design choice is it means 99% of the time, when the event isn't happening, these areas have nothing going on. And this affects a lot of areas. All of the Hornwright testing sites, the vault Tech Agricultural Centre, all of the relay towers, the mine used in load bearing, the Landview Lighthouse, all of these areas are pretty much empty unless you happen to show up when the event is active. But new players have no way of knowing when they arrive at an area if it's an event site or not. They just see an uninteresting area with nothing going on. And that's a very bad thing, because if players start subconsciously expecting that there's a good chance there's no interesting story to uncover, they'll stop thoroughly exploring locations they come across and stop going out of their way to explore more of them. And that's really bad, because players should be immersed in the world, they should find compelling stories, and they should be rewarded for properly exploring the map. And that's where we hit another problem of Fallout 76's world design, which is, even if you do try to engage with the world, learn about it, and explore it, the game won't reward you for it. Let me give you an example. When I started playing Fallout 76, I wanted to go and meet some cryptids, because they were new and cool. So the very first town you get to in the game is called Flatwoods, and there's a West Virginian cryptid called the Flatwoods Monster. So naturally, I wanted to find it. Now if you search the town thoroughly, you can find a pair of audio logs that tell the story of the Flatwoods monster via a radio play. The story states that a boy from Flatwoods goes camping at a nearby lake, hears a strange sound, follows it to a mineshaft, and then falls into an underground area where he encounters the monster. 
So I put on my detective hat and started hunting. You see, there's a handful of rivers dotted around the area, but the only thing that could be called a lake is right here. So off I went. And I walked around the entire thing. No campsite, no strange noises, no mines nearby. Alright, back to Flatwoods, where I found another lead. A note mentioning a mine shaft. Fine, it's not near water, but it is a mine. And off I went again. No strange noises, no Flatwoods monster. And where did I eventually find the Flatwoods monster? Just south of the power plant in the mire. The other side of the map from Flatwoods. I haven't been able to find definite proof of what causes him to spawn where, but the vast majority of recorded instances I've seen have put him in the mire. And that's a real shame, because if you've got a Flatwoods monster in your game, and you leave a trail of clues that hints at its location, then players should be able to find it by following those clues. Otherwise, what's the point of bothering to read the lore and explore the world if we're not going to get anything from it? Back in Fallout 3, some of the biggest and most interesting locations in the game were off the beaten track, where players wouldn't find them unless they went looking. Oasis, for example. In Fallout 76, the opposite is true. The game seems scared that any players might miss something, and thus anything significant is aggressively flagged. Let me give you an example. The first time I was exploring Vault Tech University, I came across a terminal entry mentioning a student who was doing research into cryptids and had set up a tiny shack in the woods to study them. Reading that added a map marker of the shack. And I was thrilled. This is exactly what I wanted from a Fallout game. I'd read the lore, and now I'd got a cool secret on my map. So eventually, I went off in that direction, and as soon as I got anywhere near the shack, the game generated a new miscellaneous quest for me. Investigate the shack. This appears for all players, even if they have no reason to know the shack is there. In its bid to stop players from missing out on anything, the game has undermined the entire concept of exploring. After all, if that's how it works, why bother? If there's anything there, the game will just let me know through a miscellaneous investigate quest anyway. And this isn't a one-off, it happens a lot. Go anywhere near the Tiger water plant and investigate the trailer will try and pull you to the start of ecological balance. Reach the outskirts of Monongah and your character will somehow magically know that one particular house has a secret in its basement. On reflection, this might be the most aggressively intrusive quest marker in Fallout history. It's not just showing you exactly where to go, it's pulling you into areas you haven't even visited yet. And this is really, really bad, because it makes the game so much less interesting. It's exciting to find a hidden thing that kicks off a quest because it feels like a reward for exploring. One of my favourite moments in Fallout 76 was when I was exploring the mansions around the forest lake. And I found a distinctively dressed corpse in the basement of a random house, completely out of the way, an area that no quest had told me to go to. And that kicked off the Mistress of Mystery questline, which felt great, because the only reason I found that body was because I was exploring. I felt rewarded. The game would massively benefit from more stuff like the Mistress of Mystery, in fact. It's a big, interesting, story-driven questline with unique rewards and a really distinct feel to it, thanks to little touches like the secret entrance to the Bat Cave and the AI welcoming you home when you arrive. Sadly, while it's one of the game's high points for me, it's also the exception. The vast majority of locations don't have that sort of cool hidden secret buried inside, and if there's anything of interest nearby, the game will flag it via miscellaneous quest. And that's bad for the game, because once people start getting into the habit of expecting points of interest to be flagged to them, then they'll just rush areas, they'll get through the game more quickly, and then they'll stop playing. And part of that is the current state of the events, which are an uneven bunch. I like the more frantic ones, like load bearing and one violent night, but there are some really basic ones mixed in. What you're seeing right now is footage of tea time. It's a very simple event where there are three pipes, creatures are going to attack the pipes, you stop the creatures attacking the pipes. That's literally the whole thing. Now that's pretty simple, but here's the problem. This here's uranium fever, and it's the same thing, but with three uranium processes instead. Meanwhile, this is guided meditation. Same thing, but with speakers. Death Blossoms is the same too, but people launch nukes more regularly than that event triggers, so I couldn't actually get hold of any footage of it. So, if we want Fallout 76 to have a good long lifespan, I think these are the crucial areas. The game needs to be harder, the map needs to be more interesting, individual locations need to be worth exploring, and in general, exploration needs to be rewarded. All of that I think could help people get a lot more immersed in the game, but there's still one missing element to give people a connection to the world. And that is the story.
This is a difficult one for me, because I think the storytelling in Fallout 76 is a real mixed bag. As a starting point, it is absolutely 100% possible to tell a compelling story using only environmental details, audio logs and terminal entries, even if you know that the story ends with everybody being dead. And I know this because one of my favourite stories in all of Fallout history is Vault 11 in New Vegas, which is exactly that. The first thing you find in that quest is a pile of skeletons, a discarded gun, and a tape that makes it perfectly clear that this is the end of the story and everything went to hell. But it's a great story anyway, because it's interesting to figure out exactly what went wrong, how it escalated, could it have been avoided, was it anyone in particular's fault, what went on here? And some of Fallout 76's storytelling is good stuff that contextualises the world. One thing I really like is the game mostly doesn't overtly state why the world's biomes are as they are. Why is the ash heap like it is? Why is the mire overgrown with these strangler vines? Why is the toxic valley so polluted? If you want to know, you have to dig through the game story yourself. The reveal of what happened at the ash heap, for instance, is locked in a terminal at the top of a skyscraper in Charleston, and no quest mark will ever direct you to it. It turns out that Hornwright, the CEO of a mining company obsessed with automation, found a way to use auto mining machines to spray particles of whatever they were mining up into the air, where they would be collected by automated drones, which were originally designed to help clean up air quality in general. After the bombs fell, the auto miners kept working, but the drones broke down. And now we have the ash heap. Now that's really cool. So are the political stories of power struggles in the Charleston capital, and lots of other faction-specific lore. So, what's the problem? Well, to answer that, we need to talk about storytelling in general. There's an old idea in writing that you should try and figure out if the story you're telling is the most interesting part of the character's life. And if it isn't, maybe you should be telling that story instead. So the story of Fallout 1 is set at the exact moment that the super mutants have first started emerging into the world. Fallout New Vegas opens as a battle to decide the fate of the Mojave, and the NCR itself is about to begin. Fallout 4 starts as tensions over the presence of synths is boiling over into violence in the streets, and features the Brotherhood arriving at the end of the first act. These are good moments to set a story. There's conflict, and threat, and factions. But in Fallout 76, the exciting stuff happened over the last two decades, and it seems to be mostly done now. Which is frustrating, because some of Fallout 76's story is really cool, and it sounds like a great setup for a Fallout game. You've got a faction made up of first responders, police, firefighters, and paramedics, who are just trying to do the right thing and help everybody, but we know they've made mistakes. They've taken on untrained volunteers and got people killed. They've also fired live ammunition at students at some point, though whether the targets were protesters or looters is unclear. They mostly mean well and have plenty of manpower, but they're undersupplied. And then we've got the army, rapidly reformed into a chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel, who have eyes on what manpower and resources the responders do possess. Defection goes both ways between the two, but the Brotherhood have the power armour and the big guns, and over time, they're trying to absorb the responders, what they would call an alliance, and the responders would call conscription. On the far side of the mountains, we have the Free State, pre-war isolationist apocalypse preppers who, understandably, were the best prepared for the end of the world, and possessed some of the most advanced tech, as well as good training, but they're massively low in numbers. They recently resettled and fortified Harper's Ferry, and, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, the Brotherhood are interested in their bunkers, their tech, and their well-trained and intelligent members. But the free states are fundamentally distrustful of authority, and regard the reformed US Army as exactly that. So they've started to build up a stockpile of weapons. They've seen what's happening to the responders and they won't let it happen to them, even if it means war against the Brotherhood. And yet the Brotherhood are the only faction strong enough to run convoys between Harper's Ferry and the responders for increasingly well-fortified raider territory, and the free states need those supplies. And finally, in a secret bunker, the Enclave is watching all of this, operating in secret for a handful of elite embedded agents and assassins. Now that's a great setup for a traditional Fallout game. We've got conflict, factions, you can pick a side and decide which group represents the best bet for the future. And this is what I find frustrating about Fallout 76. It feels like they could have taken this exact map and the exact story they've already written and made a really good single player campaign out of it. But instead, zombie dragons show up and also there's a zombie plague. And the problem here is when you introduce a literal zombie plague into your story, that kind of gets in the way of the faction drama, which many Fallout players are probably most interested in. 
The free states may be distrustful of the Brotherhood's long-term intentions, but, you know, there's literally zombie dragons outside, so suck it up. Which is exactly what happens. It's not even an interesting Vault 11-style tragedy, where it turns out they were their own worst enemies, and if they'd all just worked together, they'd have won. The Brotherhood fights the dragons, and they die. And the responders and the free states work together and fight the dragons, and they all die too. I mean, I guess technically the raiders didn't help, but I'm not sure they'd have turned the tide single-handedly. Anyway, everyone's dead, and now Fallout 76 begins, but it's such an odd choice to set the story there, as well as the well-publicized confirmation there were no human NPCs and everyone was dead, because it means we know what happened to everybody. They died, and we know how they died. The Scorched killed them. The Scorched killed the Brotherhood, and the Raiders, and Flatwoods, and Morgantown. I guess the Raiders got a few kills. They murdered Madigan and wiped out Charleston, but, you know, everybody's still dead. Now, the story of how somebody died can be sad and horrifying and really effective. The Keller family transcripts are my favourite audio logs in all of Fallout. And some of them in Fallout 76 are really well done. One where a responder has locked herself in a room she can't get out of and just slowly starves to death particularly stands out to me. I can hear them clawing at the door. I locked myself in a storage closet, but I don't think the door opens from the inside. But that's the only story Fallout 76 has to tell, and it starts becoming almost comical when the game flashes up the objective to search for survivors or hunt down the source of a radio transmission. In fact, the game actively has three different robots say something to the effect of, well, I bet you're surprised I'm a robot, and to be honest, no. And for the first two times it happened, I wasn't. Part of the problem is, we don't know these people. Maria Chavez, one of the responder leaders, comes up maybe three times before we find her corpse. Now, I'm sure she was lovely, but I'm not sad because I don't know anything about her. And if the game does try to characterise someone a bit more at length, like Abby or Johnny Marino, I find it hard to get invested in their personal story, knowing full well that they're already dead. So is there a solution to this? Yes, though it's not an easy one and would have worked better if it had been in from the start. But if Bethesda want to put things right with the community, this is perhaps the biggest single thing they could do. I think Fallout 76 would have benefited from being released like a Rockstar game. Single player campaign up front, and then less structured multiplayer a few weeks later. I think that would have been much more warmly accepted, and with a nice manageable campaign that lone players can play, there would perhaps have been less nerves about ramping up that multiplayer difficulty. Thematically, that could have worked really nicely as well. The campaign set during the faction tensions, before the Scorch Beasts show up, maybe 10 years before the current events of Fallout 76. It's also a great fit for a single player campaign built around factions. You can travel around, meet all the different groups, there are full dialogue trees, you join the one you want, even the raiders, there's a proper faction reputation system, the works. And in the end, your faction ends up using a nuke against another faction. The free states against the Brotherhood, the responders against the raiders, the raiders against the responders, that sort of thing. But the ending is that the nuke accidentally triggers the emergence of the Scorch Beast, which you could foreshadow, we talk of mysterious earthquakes or whatever, because then the single player campaign ends on the message, oh no, if only they'd all work together. And by the way, here's a multiplayer mode set after everyone died, so you can all work together to fix it. The other benefit of this would be then we'd actually know the characters who are all dead because we worked with them in the single player campaign. There's an actual connection. You could even track down yourself, your own single player character. That certainly sounds a lot more fun than following the Overseer as we do in Fallout 76 right now. In fact, in the current version of Fallout 76, you have to hunt down and euthanize the Overseer's husband, a character we know almost nothing about. Wouldn't it be a bit more interesting if you had to hunt down and euthanize a scorched version of your own single player character? Anyway, that's just a little detail. No matter what form it takes, a single player campaign could be a really big step in winning back some community goodwill. So, we've spoken a lot about things that are wrong and little ways that we might be able to improve them. Now I want to start pulling some of that together, a vision of what Fallout 76 could be. And to figure out what Fallout 76 should be, I think we need to start right at the very beginning. What is Fallout 76 actually about? Many Fallout games have really benefited from a single, clear objective. And Fallout 1 is perhaps the strongest example of this. You know precisely what you're doing from the moment the game opens. You're after a water chip. 
and that's reinforced every time you open the Pip Boy. Fallout New Vegas opens with you being shot in the head, and then talking to a doctor about how you were shot in the head, and all of the main quests for the first act are dedicated to tracking down the guy that shot you in the head. And Fallout 76 looks like it's gonna have precisely that level of focus. So let's just take a quick look see at the game's introduction. You must rebuild. Not just walls, not just buildings, but hearts and minds. And ultimately, America itself. Okay, great. Now let's hear what the Overseer has to say to you inside Vault 76. You have been tasked with nothing less than the rebuilding of America. Right, so we know what we're doing. We're rebuilding America. Now that's a great idea for a Fallout game. Fallout 3 was ultimately about a mission to build crucial infrastructure. Fallout New Vegas is about what society should look like. Fallout 4's Minuteman quest is broadly about building a tiny group of settlements into an alliance that can, together, stand up against external forces that want to take advantage of them. So a game set in the immediate post-war period, building the first infrastructure, founding the first societies, acting like frontier settlers in a post-apocalyptic America, that's an interesting place to take Fallout. And based on all the marketing, and the trailers, and the game's own introduction, that sounds like it's going to be the core of the game. So you're all ready to rebuild, and then you just don't. The main plot totally ignores rebuilding. You spend your time travelling from one faction's ruined base to the next, but you never rebuild them. Morgantown Airport is never resettled. The AVR Medical Center is never restored to working order. The Free State's bunkers lie silent. The Brotherhood bases and camps remain empty. And this is particularly frustrating because Fallout 76 has perhaps the most impressive architecture in the entire franchise. The monorail elevator, the space station, the water park, multiple fairgrounds. We see these huge broken down things and we want to make them work again because you told us to rebuild, and in Fallout you commonly can fix things to make them work, like Project Purity, like Helios 1, like the USS Constitution, but you just can't, you've got these stunningly beautiful giant superstructures, and they don't do anything. And this isn't just a missed opportunity, it's a much deeper problem, and to understand why, we need to dig into what makes architecture in Fallout distinct. Fallout settlements are interesting, I think, because they're built out of things that aren't supposed to be settlements. That makes them interesting to the player and distinct from each other. From the repurposed vehicles that mark the edge of Junktown, to the Unity's repurposed cathedral, the bomb at the heart of Megaton, the ship that houses Rivet City, the baseball stadium that became Diamond City. And since Fallout 3, this has become particularly important, because in a 3D Fallout game, it's crucial that settlements have large and easily recognisable profiles to draw in players, like Novak's T-Rex, Prim's roller coaster, Tempany Tower being much taller than it strictly needs to be, as the interior only actually includes four floors, the smoke from Nipton, Bunker Hill's monument, the Lucky 38 shining in the night, and at the core of this, there are two key facts. One, it makes sense to build in and around existing structures. If there are a good number of well-built, still-standing structures available, you would use those rather than build something new from scratch. And two, if given a choice, players will probably choose to build in and around existing structures because that's how Fallout settlements have always been done, even when we weren't the ones building them. And perhaps most bafflingly of all, Fallout 76 acknowledges this, because that's precisely what all the factions of West Virginia did. The responders set up bases in the airport and the fire station because they're solid and easily defensible. The Brotherhood of Steel occupy and fortify tough old buildings. The Free States chose to resettle Harpers Ferry specifically because they could use and fortify the existing structures. And yet the moment you're let loose and asked to rebuild America, you do the exact opposite. And that's not by choice, it's because Bethesda have imposed rules that specifically block players from doing the exact thing Fallout has always encouraged us to do, including Fallout 76. In fact, let me tell you a story. The first time I saw the giant satellite dish in the Savage Divide, I wanted to climb it. But there was no way to get up there. So I figured I'd just build my own way up there. But not only can you not build under the dish, despite the fact that it will provide protection against the elements, you can't build anywhere near it. The no camp barrier around the satellite is extremely aggressive. It's like they wanted to make absolutely certain nobody could get on top of it. Even though a camp built under or even on top of a giant satellite dish would be fallouty and distinctive and fun, it's not allowed. 
and this means that most camps will be built on empty land, and with nothing to build around, the vast majority of them end up looking pretty much identical. Simple, single or two-story wooden shacks, possessing a selection of workbenches, and a bed. This isn't rebuilding America, it's 20-odd hermits scattered across a wasteland. Now this is an annoyance, sure, but it's also a symptom of one of Fallout 76's biggest missed opportunities. So why aren't we rebuilding America? To answer that, let me tell you about something that happened to me. You see, when I heard about Fallout 76, my immediate thought was that I wanted to be a shopkeeper, because it's something I've never been able to do in a Fallout game before. So rather than adventuring to earn money, what if I was an artisan? What if I gathered and crafted and sold things? I've always liked playing Fallout in a pacifist style. This felt like the logical extreme. But when I started playing the game, I immediately ran into problems. Because of the anti-camp barriers, I can't set up a camp in a prominent location, just outside a major quest location where traffic will pass through. So any shop has so few customers that it would just be you standing in an empty room 99% of the time, even if we overlook the fact that the number of players in any session is far too low to realistically create any form of service economy. But even if I could find a spot that I could slap down a camp extremely nearby to a major location, and even if there was a significant increase in the number of people allowed in a single session, I can guarantee that it would still have almost no traffic, because the map simply isn't designed to have any form of central hub. On the contrary, the world seems to be intentionally decentralised. There's no resource gathering hub, because junk is spread around everywhere, and there are over 20 workshops, all with multiple resources, and they can only be held by one person at a time anyway, so there's no need to gather around any of them. There's no shopping hub, because there are more automated vendor bots scattered across the map than I can count, and in a world where most quests are automatically generated without a specific quest giver, there's not even a hub where people frequently visit to acquire or turn in those quests. And as a result of that, and it's hard to tell whether this is intentional or not, every settlement is a ghost town. Flatwoods was bustling just after launch, but these days it's deserted unless a new player happens to be passing through. And I guess you could argue this is good. A Fallout game should be a harrowing, lonely experience picking through the silent ruins of humanity. And that's definitely a part of it, but games need contrast too. Earlier I was discussing this as a weakness in Fallout 76's storytelling. When every story ends the same way, and then the Scorch killed us all, the stories get more predictable and less interesting. We need variety. Give us desolate ways, sure, but we need moments of bustling life too. The hub, Megaton, the Strip, Diamond City, the existence of a living town is important because the contrast makes the lonely moments in the wasteland stand out more. And here we come back to the theme of rebuilding. Was the intention that we would be the ones to build the towns? But you just can't because of one huge glaring issue with the game. No one will ever build a successful town in Fallout 76 in its current form because nobody needs a town. We've touched on this briefly already, but this is where the abundance of survival supplies and of the tools to produce them starts really hurting the game. You see, everything you need, workstations, cooking stations, bed, shelter, crops, water, it's all gifted to you in the first hour of the game in the tutorial missions of Flatwoods. Now just stop and really think about that for a second. In a multiplayer online game with survival elements, any lone player will have the capability to be comfortably and entirely self-sufficient within an hour of starting the game. You will never need anybody else again for survival. The only thing you do need is someone to buy your excess stuff. So luckily, there are guaranteed robot stores available all over the place every responder base, every train station, every major settlement. So why would people form towns? In real life, people tend to form into groups because it's mutually beneficial. And while it may be possible to be self-sufficient, it's very inefficient to have everybody just about subsisting. A settlement needs to offer an advantage to those who live there over living alone, and ideally a service it can offer to outsiders to draw them in that the town alone can provide. That's how a town might organically form, but neither of those things is true in Fallout 76. Now earlier we discussed how fear of alienating various player groups was the likely cause of survival mechanics being made so simple as to become effectively trivial. This is the same problem I think. A fear that the camp system could be frustrating leads to the game throwing extremely crucial plans at us in the first hour of the game. A fear that the player might not be able to sell something leads to vendor bots everywhere. But here's the tragic consequence of all of that. This is stuff that the players might have built for themselves and for each other, but nobody has because nobody needs to because Bethesda showered us with too much stuff. So can this be fixed? In theory, yes, and some of the solutions are actually fairly easy. In fact, they're in Fallout 4. 
You see, in Fallout 4 it wasn't the case that level 2 characters could found a functionally perfect town with a population of 1. If you wanted a decent town, you actually had to invest, choosing the local leader perks, and then putting significant volumes of cash into your stores to let them carry a greater range of goods. If you didn't invest in those perks, then you had to rely on existing towns. But if you did invest, and we're talking thousands and thousands of caps here, you could create a settlement that was superior to any other town in the game. Now, straight away, it's pretty obvious how we could immediately increase the chances of a player settlement becoming a hub. Let us build our own vendor bots. And to be clear, just about anything will be better than the current AI vendor bot who seem to be part of an elaborate scam. You see, I once sold a redundant bit of legendary gear to one of them for eight caps. I then happened to glance over at his apparel screen and he was selling it for a hundred. Why is a robot imposing a 1,250% markup? What is he doing with the profit? He's a bloody robot. Now, on this point, we have some really good news. Bethesda just announced this is the exact direction they're moving in and craftable vending machines will soon be added to the game so players can set the price of an item and then any visitor can buy it. Now this is a good start though there is an obvious issue. A vendor bot can both buy and sell. A vending machine only sells making it arguably less desirable if the visitor has selling to do as well. Now player run buying is more tricky to arrange but not by much, just allow a player to specify what items they want to allow the vendor bot to buy, either at a very high level, aid, junk, or more precisely, purified water, copper, that sort of thing. The amount of caps in the bot's inventory is simply whatever the owner chooses to give it, plus whatever's added to that amount by any sales it makes, and as for the prices, either let the player set the buying price of specific items, or in the case of shops that buy anything, or items with huge numbers of variants like weapons or armour, set your desired profit, how much below the game assigned actual value you're willing to pay. Both of these systems, however, have one major issue. We know where the vendor bots are, responder bases, train stations but nobody knows where your base is and the anti-camp barriers mean it's probably out of the way and nobody knows what you're buying or selling there. So a couple of further amendments to make this system work. Firstly, I'd say that any camp with a shop probably wants to be visited. So let's add those camps onto the map, maybe with a tiered system of icons. So multiple shops with large inventories or plenty of caps are flagged as major trade hubs. Secondly, we need to let players advertise their shops. If you've got a strong instigating weapon, somebody's going to buy that if they know it's there. Or, under my system, you might desperately need a particular resource, and so you're willing to pay more money to anybody willing to sell it to you, but nobody knows you need it. I propose that we could build radio towers and broadcast simple messages, flagging the presence of a desirable legendary you're selling or the high price you're willing to buy a particular component for. We could even put these messages on everybody's map screen to help get the word out. My point is, it's not enough to just let us buy or sell. We need a way to let every other player know where we are and what we offer. And this could trigger a virtuous circle. Once people know there's a good player-run trade hub on the map, well, why not build your own camp nearby? And once you have people actually congregating somewhere, you've got the foundation for an economy and a town. We could also do a lot more with workstations. Sure, players need basic workstations to do scrapping and basic crafting, but isn't it odd that the chemistry workstation you got the plan for in Flatwoods at level 3 is the same one you're still using at level 100? A system of tiered or upgradable workstations could further help encourage players to visit well-established camps, or even set up their own camp next door, beginning the organic growth of a town. We could say that high-level players could set up upgraded armour workbenches that allows everyone who uses it to repair or craft for less material, or maybe an upgraded weapon workbench that can repair to beyond maximum condition automatically, or maybe even apply unique mods like the Scorch Killer mods. And I think this is in line with Bethesda's thinking. You see, there are plenty of charisma perks that incentivize people hanging out together by giving a benefit to the whole team from one person taking the perk. I'm suggesting basically the same thing here, but on a camp level, let people who spend time and effort building their camp be treated like players who spend time and effort creating a charisma heavy support character. Let them pass a benefit onto others who visit their camp and just watch as people start to form mini communities because they'll actually have a reason to do so. This could also be a really cool option for post endgame stuff. Let us try to found our own settlements and see if we can attract people to live there. Two small notes though Bethesda. In terms of the anti-camp barriers, just take them down. Let us build in fun, interesting places. 
Fine, don't let me build right next to Vault 76 or Flatwood, though bafflingly you totally can build just outside Vault 76 and completely block the path there. But do let us build in as many places as possible, and I promise the interesting towns that people make will be worth it. And second, allow camps to be built closer together. Right now, even if you're on the same team, there's a weird no man's land between camp boundaries, meaning you can't even be a neighbour to your own teammate. Let's get rid of that as well. If people want to build their camps next to each other, let them be neighbours, let them build little townships. Honestly, I can't see a downside to it. Now, all of this will be a step in the right direction, except there's one big problem. Arguably, the biggest problem in Fallout 76. The core issue that keeps coming up in every system. And that is permanence. So let's talk about how Fallout 76 works in the background. As Bethesda stressed from the very beginning at E3, you never see a server list when you play the game. You are instead assigned at random to an appropriate server, joining or being joined by your team or friends if there's room. This means that if you play in the morning, take a break and then play again in the afternoon, you won't be in the same session. Or, if you are, you'd have no way of knowing this. Now this, as many people know, is very open to abuse. Get pinned down by a Scorch Beast you don't want to fight, quit to menu, rejoin, new world, no Scorch Beast. Finding a building you wanted to loot is already looted, restart, it's magically regrown its loot. And server hopping was even more frequent to force shops to refresh their stock before Bethesda gave vendors certain fixed inventories. Now that's a problem, but I don't think it's the biggest one. You see, because you're going to hop between various sessions, that means when you log out, your camp disappears. If I see a really cool camp one day and its owner logs off, I'll probably never see it again. It's as if it was never there. And here come the cogs again. Because a Fallout game about rebuilding the world? Great idea. An online Fallout experience with seamless servers, so new players and experienced ones rub shoulders? Sure, that could work. But a Fallout game about rebuilding in an environment where nothing you rebuild can ever stay built because you're only ever a temporary visitor to any given version of reality? Well, obviously that's not going to work because it's impossible to rebuild America if anything you build fades away the moment you aren't there to watch it. Now there are a few things you are allowed to rebuild and repair, and they're a frustrating hint at what could have been. Powering up Poseidon, for example, is an event that pops up and asks you to repair a power station. It's a fairly long process involving repairing cooling systems, generators, and the reactor itself, where movements around the facility is much easier if you have access to the hacking perks. Though, frustratingly, the repairs are exclusively a case of walking up to damaged pipes and consoles and pressing A. No amount of perks, materials, or intelligence actually helps. But when you're done, something really cool happens. The power plant starts operating, the cooling towers billow out steam which can be seen from all over the map, and the power plant genuinely does start generating power. Across the local area, in workshops, you can find power terminals which, if Poseidon is operating, generate large amounts of power for free. In short, you were asked to repair infrastructure, and as a result of you doing so, there is a visible impact on the world, and a benefit to both yourself and everyone else in the area. This is cool, this is fallouty, it's like Helios 1 except this time the power you've put into the grid can actually be used for something practical. Except we have a problem. Fallout 76 is an online game, and if you fix the power plant, that would mean that other players couldn't do so, and that means the power plant can't remain fixed. So sooner or later, it's just going to break down again so someone else can do the same quest. But even if it didn't, it wouldn't matter because the moment you log out, there's no guarantee you're going to rejoin the universe where you fixed the power plant in the first place. And now I think we're getting to the real core of the problem. We have three different elements at play here. A game about rebuilding America, a part of the Fallout franchise, and a seamless online game. And I'm suspicious that... In their current forms, they will never properly mesh because of one extremely important concept in Fallout. You see, a Fallout game comes with certain expectations. One of these is that what you do will actually have some form of consequence. That was one of the key design philosophies underpinning the original Fallout games. And in different ways, Fallout has mostly stayed true to that idea. Whether in the additional random encounters of Fallout 3 that I've discussed at length previously, the faction system of New Vegas that's generally held up as the gold standard, or Fallout 4, which admirably let you gun down the leaders of three main factions the moment you first met them and permanently sever your ties with them if that's what you wanted to do. This idea that a choice should have lasting consequences, thus giving decisions weight, is for many people absolutely central to what Fallout is. And Fallout 76 is strangely lacking in consequence. 
Let me tell you a story from my time with the game, and the quest Mare for a Day, which boils down to getting yourself recognised as a friendly by the many robots that live in Watoga, and the reason you're supposed to do all of that is so it's safe for you to live inside this futuristic modern city. But of course, you can't live in the city. Camps can't be placed there, and there's no way to make any of the huge empty apartment buildings into your base. I made the decision to do the quest, but there was no consequence for me doing so. Still, what we do have in Fallout 76 is factions. Factions are great. Everyone loves a faction system. And even better, factions are a great way of offering a consequence-loaded choice to the player. Killian or Gizmo? NCR, Legion or House? Brotherhood, Railroad, Institute or Minutemen? Pick a side and that locks you out of the other, and often leads into direct conflict with them. And as we've discussed, Fallout 76 has a load of factions you're encouraged to join, except you're not really joining them. You don't join the Brotherhood in Fallout 76 because you like them better than the alternative, or you agree with them ideologically. You join them because joining them is the only way to get past their automated security. In fact, by the end of Fallout 76, you've joined pretty much every faction, including both the Brotherhood and the Enclave. And in a rather major step backwards after Fallout New Vegas and Fallout 4, there's only one way to complete the main quest, which also happens to involve repairing an overtly murderous AI, which definitely feels like a very bad thing to do. But let's put that aside for now, because this here is a big pile of issues that are especially problematic for a Fallout game. Nothing you build stays built, nothing you repaired stays working, completed quests have no impact on the world, joining a faction means nothing, even fighting enemies is a fool's errand, the game states fighting the Scorch Beast is your ultimate priority, but it doesn't matter if you fight everyone you see or you never bother fighting a single one until the game starts pushing boss fights on you, they keep respawning at the same rate anyway. The underlying problem here is that this is a world where nothing has meaningful consequences, and it's very hard to truly care about a world where you can be confident that nothing you do will make any difference. And perhaps the worst example of this is how Fallout 76 treats nukes. Now, Fallout games have told many stories over the years, but one thing is universal. The world nuking itself was bad. Nukes are bad. Radiation is bad. In Fallout 1, radiation was an invisible evil, slowly killing you as you move through the waste. Destroying Megaton is the joint most evil action you can take in Fallout 3. Dropping a nuke on the NCR or Legion in New Vegas will lower your reputation with them to the lowest it can go. Radiation turns humans into zombies, and those who keep their minds suffer horrendous discrimination and violence. The Keller family transcripts in Fallout 3 in particular summarise the absolute horror of watching the bombs fall. Oh my god, it's really happening. I can see the clouds. It's so big! Mom! I'm so scared! And even when nukes are deemed an acceptable solution to a major problem, like the Cathedral nuke in Fallout 1, or the destruction of the Institute in Fallout 4, detonating a nuke is the most significant thing you can do. Wiping out the leader of the Unity, or destroying an entire faction, and the benefits they provide, in a single moment. These are huge, world-shaping decisions. But the nukes in Fallout 76 are different because no one seems sure if they're good or not. The Overseer is specifically tasked with securing the nukes, and then overtly says we need to be prepared to use them on the Scorch Beast, but then chastises you if you do. The Brotherhood are instructed not to use nukes under any circumstances, and then they just sort of do it anyway. And perhaps most worryingly of all, the only voice in the game that seems perfectly content for you to use nukes is the aforementioned rogue AI that murdered everyone in the White Springs bunker, which presumably was the entire pre-war government because that was who the bunker was for. So story-wise, the game is a bit confused about nukes, but the real problem is mechanical, because launching them has no negative consequences whatsoever. I'll overlook the final quest where a nuke is used to expose the Scorch Beast Queen, because there's a long history of using a nuke of some description to deal with the final big bad guy in Fallout. Fallout 1, Fallout 2, 3 with Broken Steel, and Fallout 4, so we can hardly complain there. But most nukes are not being used for that. Most nukes are used because nuke zones are full of useful crafting materials and high level enemies for XP and legendary farming. In fact, nukes are so good that as soon as one goes off, any player of a high enough level in possession of power armour will head straight for it. It is, perhaps rather strangely, the only time there's a high concentration of players in a single area. And after a few hours, the nuke zone goes back to normal. There are no negative consequences for launching a nuclear weapon, not for the players that do it, not for the area that it hits. So, how do we fix all of this? 
Well, in terms of fixing nukes in particular, this is going to take a pretty major rework. But I do have a few ideas. First, we need another mechanism to access flux, the rare nuclear materials currently found exclusively in nuke zones. As long as nuke zones are the only way to access it, people will keep launching nukes. Maybe there could be a special machine to produce it in your camp with a limit of how many of them you can build. But I'd argue it should be a slow process, much slower than the rate that you could harvest in a nuke zone. So now, we have a choice. Nuke the world we're supposed to be rebuilding to speed things up, or slowly harvest material over time. But in a Fallout game, where launching nukes is generally frowned upon and also considered quite a big deal, I think we need a whole new system to make nuke launchers into a major event. Under my proposed system, launching a nuke becomes a map-wide PvP special event. Everybody is informed that a personal team is trying to launch a nuke, and everyone can join in, either helping them to do it, or forming an impromptu team to stop them. But here's the twist. To sweeten the deal and compensate the team that's trying to stop the existence of a nuke zone, if they do successfully stop the launch, they get rewarded with Flux and a handful of good quality legendaries too. We could add more flavour to this as well. Modus sometimes offers an event called a real blast in which the player is rewarded for dropping some bombs on a random area. But what if Modus, being as he is, an insane kill bot, offered a huge reward to drop a nuke? What if he wanted you to drop it on the sort of major player trading hub I proposed earlier? Sure, this idea probably needs some work and some balancing, but the reason I like it conceptually is because it recontextualizes nuking the world as a bad thing, a thing that people will fight to stop, and it turns a mechanism where everybody got together to explore a nuke zone because nukes were awesome into the biggest PvP event in the game, where it's actually possible for people to keep West Virginia nuke free. Also, even if it's purely an aesthetic thing, let's have more lasting consequences to a nuke zone. Even if it's just some dead grass and dead trees replacing the normal assets and some low-level background radiation, at least for a couple of in-game days. Let players know that something bad happened here. But personally, I'd like to go a lot further than that. Nukes cause, you know, fallout. So let's actually have the world be negatively impacted. Let's have dying wildlife and trees across the map. Let's have soot kicked up into the sky, making the whole world darker. Let's have vicious rad storms. You want to nuke and strip mine the world? I hope you enjoy the entire forest region dying. And all that extra radiation, let's whack up the amount of rads in your food. Even purified water should slowly be picking up rads. And all of this fallout probably isn't healthy for humans either. So I hope you enjoy wearing gas masks all the time or all sorts of nasty new diseases might just be picked up. The sort of nasty thing that might mean you need to have a limb amputated, for example, and replaced with a lovely metal claw. Launching a nuke should have devastating consequences, but ones that some players might want to live with. Maybe you're content with living in a radioactive nightmare where soot blocks out the sun and you can wipe out every plant on the map. For some people, that's going to be a price worth paying for access to the nuke zones. Of course, there could also be buildable tech to clean up the fallout and restore the world to how it was, but I would expect that that would be a very slow process. This, I think, would make nukes a lot more interesting, and it would make the whole world more interesting too, where some people live in pristine, untouched nature, and others in soot-blasted dead hellscapes. Except, of course, we can't do any of this right now, because a seamless online experience is pretty much completely incompatible with these ideas, a consequence within a single session means nothing if everybody involved will just end up in different sessions tomorrow, leaving any devastation for the next bunch of confused players to mop up. Now, step one is changing the server system, of course, with a character tied to a particular world, so a character you've invested time into has to live with the consequences of their actions and the actions of their neighbours. Without that, you can't have any form of meaningful consequence to any action. To offset the fact that not everyone will be around all the time, that probably means a lot more people being assigned to a single world, though that's honestly necessary anyway to have any chance of communities organically growing. But it's not that simple of course. We can't impose a traditional Fallout experience on Fallout 76 because an online experience is incompatible with certain big Fallout faction choices. You can't pick one of two people to run Junktown and kill the other in Fallout 76 because then the next player in line couldn't make that exact choice. You can't blow up Megaton because then Megaton wouldn't be there for the next player. An online experience of any description sits rather uneasily alongside a Fallout game because you can't make a choice with a consequence that robs future players of the same choice. But I think there is a solution which Bethesda are already terrifyingly close to. 
What if Fallout 76 was about, and hold on to your hats here, because I'm about to blow your flipping minds, rebuilding America? So, let's start bringing all my ideas together here, and write some fan fiction about what I would love Fallout 76 to look like. Now, I've already spoken about how I want certain areas in the game to be brutally difficult, with tougher enemies, dangerous environments, and lower carry weights to make the wasteland a more dangerous place. But I think there needs to be a flip side to that too. We need to find a way to encourage the foundation of bustling towns, and we've discussed some mechanics to help with that already. And that's because the contrast between the two is critical. In town, you should be safe. There should be plentiful food, plentiful water, there should be other players and shops and everything you'd expect from a Fallout town. If there are high level players in the town, they might have already built upgraded workbenches that you can use, as well as player built vendor bots that'll always be plenty on offer, potentially including the opportunity to buy junk if anyone's selling it, which again is an example of player built communities helping to counteract the difficulty of the base game. And because we have a fixed server system in my world, these camps and their infrastructure will always be there, even if their players aren't. But as you start your expedition out of town, the longer you stay away, the harder your life gets. Weapons deteriorate, food runs out, stim packs run low. So right now you can just summon your camp to you anytime you want, and I want to maintain the ability for anybody to set up anywhere. But I think the cap cost of moving your camp needs to be vastly higher to stop people summoning their own infrastructure to them whenever they get a bit thirsty. Moving your camp should be a big decision, but something you still might wish to do in my version, because that's where you reappear when you die, so it becomes a tactical choice. You can effectively create an autosave point whenever you want, but it's going to cost you to do it. This is, in some ways, a remixed version of the sleep to save mechanic from Fallout 4 Survival Mode, and like that game, it's not just your camp that drops the respawn point, it's any camp at all. So visiting another camp as you pass is worth doing, hopefully further incentivizing positive player interactions. But, we have a problem of course. Where you respawn is meaningless if you can just fast travel to where you were when you died. And here we need to address fast travel, and Fallout 4 once again provides a very good idea for us. I would basically eliminate fast travel in this game, and replace it with an Institute Teleporter style one-way system. What this means is, you can fast travel back home to your camp any time you want, thanks to, say, an emergency evacuation vertibot. But it's a one-way trip. If you want to head back out to where you were in the wilderness, you're on foot again. Now this probably all sounds very harsh, and that is of course intentional, because I want Fallout 76 to be tough enough that players embrace the most precious resource of all each other. I want convoys of players travelling together for safety. I want people heading out on expeditions to plan a route, checking what towns exist on the map and moving from town to town to restock and create a new respawn point in case they die. I want people to set up lone camps as safe havens between towns to act as a place to resupply. A single small camp with a vendor bot that's kept well stocked with food and water could make a savvy player a lot of money. Because scarcity means demand, and demand will create supply. Put us in a brutally difficult world, and players will find all sorts of interesting ways to overcome it. So how do I see these towns working? Very simply, in fact. We modify camps slightly, so that they can be built much closer together than in the current game. If a certain number of camps exist in a group, the game acknowledges that as a town, and it appears immediately on everybody's map screen. Anyone who sets up their camp next to a town is immediately a citizen of the town, and to help encourage people to join communities, the cost of moving a camp, which is high in my version, is massively reduced if it's to join an existing town. Now with every new person that joins, the town's border expands, and creates a larger area of free public space that belongs to the town, that any citizen can build in to create public amenities, water supplies, farming, that sort of thing, which the town can choose to make available to all players, or restrict to just citizens. After all, in a world with low carry weight, gouging passing visitors for water and food could be very good business indeed. And once someone in town has the ability to build vendor bots, that's marked on the town too, so people know they can come to trade. So right now this is just a few camps that show up on the map. Nice, but not game changing. Well, we're just getting started. 
One of the key factors of a town should be that towns automatically provide a benefit to their residents that's determined by the existing location or old world structure the town is built around. Oh yes, I'm not just allowing people to build in and around existing structures, I'm incentivizing it. Let's say that you built a town around Mama Dolce's in Morgantown. You can get free canned food delivered directly to you if you're at home or left in your stash if you're away. Charleston's proximity to the mines could mean citizens get free raw resources. Harper's Ferry with its armory gives citizens free ammo. Resettle Camden Park and get Mr. Fuzzy tokens. Turn the White Springs golf course into a town and get a free White Springs robot butler. We should have some fun with this too and come up with all sorts of unique benefits for all the different locations across the map. And if you want to build a town in the most insane locations imaginable, go right ahead. We could add in Far Harbor's fog condensers. So if you want to set up an oasis town in the middle of the ash heap smoke, you go nuts. Build a city on top of the monorail elevator. Help me finally fulfill my dream and construct an entire town on top of that bloody satellite dish. And now that we're all living together in permanently settled locations, we can actually rebuild America. We can build public amenities, a barricade around the side of the town, a single gate into the town, guarded by robots. And towns, I'd argue, could be the key to post-endgame content, because I think towns should have access to a whole new set of structures that single camps can't access, providing new tools to all residents. These can only be built by high-level players and could be gated behind the town's population too, but once built, all citizens benefit. For example, how about a cattle ranch? If someone builds that in the town, everyone gets access to a pack Brahmin. And that's precisely what it sounds like, a Brahmin that acts like a temporary companion, following you around with a significant carry capacity that you can utilize. But of course, Brahmin is squishy, and if the Brahmin dies, well, whatever you loaded up is going to be lost because you can't fast travel back home while over encumbered. Naturally, that means you'd ideally travel around with a team of people with a Brahmin each to keep them safe and head out to ruins together to loot so you can bring home a big haul and I've just invented prospector convoys. Meanwhile, as each town is extremely strong at producing one specialised thing, that means there could be some excellent sense in taking a Brahmin train loaded up with food from Morgantown over to Charleston where food is more scarce but they're swimming in raw resources and suddenly we have trade convoys moving around the world. But we can go further. Let towns dedicate themselves to rebuilding America. Let us fix up train lines and actually run trains. The stations and tracks are right there. The monorail too. This could be great post end game content. Sure, I'm taking fast travel away from you, but if you want to rebuild it, I won't stop you. The game has rail lines running from Grafton and the very north of the Savage Divide, through the forest, through Charleston to the Ash Heap, while the Monroe runs from the south of the Ash Heap, over the mountains, through the Cranberry Bog and up to the edge of the Mire. That's pretty much a transport network with total map coverage and only a single train to monorail exchange. And I see no reason why you shouldn't be allowed to make it run again, allowing fast travel between any operational stations as long as you're a citizen of a town with a working train or monorail. So this is all very utopian so far, but of course, there has to be a downside. Being rich and successful in the post-apocalypse makes you a target after all. And to make that happen, I'd reintroduce the Raiders to the Savage Divide, which shouldn't be too controversial as Raiders are basically functionally the same as the Scorched. So, we can just give them some big bases to live in across the Savage Divide. They'll attack anything that comes near them, but mostly they'll leave you alone, until towns start getting big and advanced. Then, they might be interested in raiding. And a raid is a big deal, possibly the biggest battle that can happen in the entire game. You'll be warned that it's coming a fair bit in advance, and we're talking a massive multi-stage attack with hundreds of raiders coming down from the mountains with the goal of burning the entire town to the ground. You'll see it on the map slowly moving towards you. But you do have options. You can build walls around your town if you have the resources of course, and military robots and all sorts of defensive turrets and traps too. Nothing to stop you laying mines if you want, or inviting another town's citizens to come and help with the defence. After all, a crushing defeat will mean it takes a lot longer for the raiders to attack again. Alternatively, you could launch a preemptive strike, damaging their bases in the mountains, attacking their troops while they're on the move towards the town, or hitting their camps at night while they sleep. All of that will ensure their attack will be weaker when it does reach the town. Of course, a nuke dropped on them would sort out the situation nice and easily assuming the rest of the players on the map are happy with you dropping nukes to sort out your local problems, when in my version, the whole map suffers from environmental devastation. Oh, and speaking of nukes, 
There's nothing to stop anybody trying to nuke a town, of course. Though as my nuke launches a PvP event, the citizens can come together to try to prevent it. But what about the threat from other players? Well, PvP is a difficult one for me. Personally, I think the official survival mode feels like a step in the wrong direction. Having everyone being terrified of each other will lead to less positive player interactions, when I think we should be aiming for more. But equally, I can see how the current glove slap dueling system is a bit toothless. So, I propose a compromise. By default, all players play by current dueling rules. Except for one thing. A player can go to a raider camp and offer to join them. And player raiders play by their own set of rules. If you're a raider, PvP is permanently enabled both ways. You can shoot anybody immediately and anyone can attack you too. But unlike other players, raiders can't live in towns and all town defences will shoot them on sight of course. They don't even get camps in fact. Raiders survive instead by fighting. Killing players lets a raider steal some of that player's inventory. Things like food, water, medicine, junk, ammo. Never weapons or apparel though, they can't steal your loadout. So raiders are bad news, but they have major disadvantages too. As raiders, they maintain a permanent bounty which can never go below 100 caps. So they can't ever see normal players on the map, but all normal players can see them, letting people work around them or ambush them, as 100 caps isn't nothing. Raiders can of course see town locations, and just like attacking players, destroying parts of a town gives them components. Though, as another disadvantage, because raiders don't get camps, they have to respawn up in the Savage Divide every time they die. They need to be very careful before engaging, otherwise they've got a very long walk ahead of them. Raiders can team up with other raiders of course, but PvP stays on between them as well. Raiders don't make reliable allies after all. Raiders can choose to stop being raiders any time by the way, but it leaves a mark on your reputation. Your label on the map and over your character will mark you as an ex-raider. You'll maintain any bounty you have when you quit, and going forward, any bounty you pick up will be double the usual amount. Now the reason I like this idea is that hunting players with bounties is one of my favourite things in Fallout 76. It's cool and tends to stalk them and try and figure out the right moment to engage. But there are so few bounties floating around and they're generally so low value that it's not worth the trouble to hunt them down. This way there could be a permanent game of cat and mouse happening between citizens and raiders. I also like how well it works thematically because raiders need civilization to prey on. There's nothing to stop an entire server of raiders existing where, of course, Everybody can attack everybody, but with no camps on the map, a server of raiders will basically be stuck just about surviving, scavenging as well as they can, using public workbenches because they don't have their own, completely unable to ever build anything, repair anything, the trains will never run, it's a dead end. And that's maybe my favourite thing about my version of Fallout 76, aside from the fact it's entirely fictitious and thus I don't need to bother considering how insanely difficult any of this would actually be to make work. And that's how much the world can change in my version. Right now, we have a situation where the world is basically static. Nothing lasts, even nukes don't matter. But in my world, one person server is a nuke-free utopia, lush and alive, where thriving cities of traders and prospectors travel in comfort in a restored monorail. Another server is an eternally dark nuclear winter, where every plant on the map has died, and raiders in gas masks and hazmat suits murder each other to stay alive another few hours. You know, I'd like to think that some of these ideas are good ideas, and I hope you'd agree that some of this is in the spirit of Fallout. A game with a harsh wasteland, tough choices to make, and consequences to those choices. A game that feels a bit more like an RPG, where you can actually play a role of your choosing in the world. I won't even pretend all these ideas are practical. Some of them probably aren't. I'm basically describing a total rework of just about everything. But maybe, just maybe, this could help push Fallout 76 in a good direction if a few of these points spark a few ideas over at Bethesda. Because I don't think Fallout 76 is a bad game in its current state, but I do think it could be better. Do I think it'll happen? Well, that depends. What we've seen so far from Bethesda in patches and dev diaries seems to be a focus in two directions. The first is bug fixing and balance tweaks. This is welcome, absolutely, but that just eases the symptoms. It doesn't cure the root problem. The other is new content. Again, welcome, but more stuff to do within a world built out of flawed systems isn't necessarily going to win many people back. I would urge Bethesda to consider taking a few steps back and looking at some of the core gameplay, 
the junk economy, the question of scarcity and abundance, the difficulty level, how character builds work, how camps work, and considering that there's an argument for a major rethink of how the world operates at its most basic level. This would be a huge and disruptive task, but it's not unknown. No Man's Sky went dark for a time and returned with a much stronger game that won some people back. Stellaris has rebuilt its core gameplay mechanics twice since launch already. And that's the big question for the future of Fallout 76. Will it be modestly improved over time, or is there a chance that there could be a radical rethink of how the whole world works? Anyway, I suspect I've spoken for quite long enough. Thank you for joining me for this. Congratulations for making it to the end. Do stick around if you've not already subscribed. We will, of course, be keeping an eye on Fallout 76 as it evolves. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd, and this has been Fallout 76. What went wrong, and how to fix it. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Ah, we have got a gate key here, and then we have got a... I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake! This is going to take all of my skill and cunning as a hunter to sort out... Die, you moving bastards! Die! Die! Go, go away. Go away, nobody likes you. That was a good idea till it wasn't.